In the summer of 1999, Derby proved itself to be an East Midlands city with a heart of gold. For the residents of this famous railway town, as elsewhere across the UK, showed that British people care, digging deep in their pockets to find humanitarian aid in the aftermath of another Yugoslav war. Kosovo Train for Life is the story of how the aid collected reached the unfortunate souls of Kosovo. A journey of 2,600 miles, traversing 12 countries and the metals of 14 railway companies on a mission to save lives. Kosovo particularly, it's an ancient Albanian land. Historically looking at it, Illyria was almost all over the Balkans. And we are the descendants, we are one of the clans who managed to survive. Very resilient people, I believe we are, because we suffered and struggled along to survive, to exist as Albanians. But we never actually had the chance of maintaining our own identity as Kosovars. Turks, they actually were happy enough to withdraw and leave Albania carved by Greeks and Serbs and Bulgarians and God knows what. And the Western world weren't going to recognize that an Albania exists because for 530 years being ruled by the Turks, they thought there is no more such as Albania. Until 20th November proved the whole world wrong. Oh, there is something called Albania when we declared our own independence. However, a map of ethnic Albania illustrates favoritism. In November 1912, Albania was born, but as the arbiters were biased towards her neighbors, over 60% of Albanians found themselves outside of the motherland. Albania, when you look at it, it's, it's round here. And now, for example, this is the whole large 88% of, of, uh, of its territory that has been lost. It is proof of the injustice that have been made by the superpowers. And every Albanian you ask, particularly in Kosovo, Macedonia and Montenegro, they disagree. Why should we have borders within ourselves? It's not fair. Kosovo, a mineral-rich former Ottoman vilayet, was gifted to Serbia, the sworn enemy. And post-World War I, it became an insignificant corner of a new Slav nation, which was renamed in 1929. By that time, it was an unstable Serbian dictatorship with separatist problems. During World War II, this unlikely duo, Hitler and Mussolini, reunited Kosovo with Albania to create a greater Albania under Italian occupation. However, with peace, the enemy Josip Broz Tito, a former resistance fighter and new Yugoslav leader, brought Kosovo back into Serbia as part of his communist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, an economic bloc of six republics. Within Serbia, Kosovo and Vojvodina were autonomous regions. The people denied republics because they, like their lands, had origins in Albania and Hungary, respectively. Some superficial self-rule over the fertile fields of Kosovo had begun, but Tito's progressive improvements virtually made Kosovo a country within a country in 1974, much to the displeasure of Serbs. However, after Tito's death in 1980, the tables turned as Kosovars continued their drive for greater self-rule. We already asked the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia to, to recognize Kosovo as a republic within Yugoslavia, which was crushed badly from 1981 to 1989. 
Serbian leader Slobodan Milošević championed Kosovo's oppressed Serb minority, rewaking in national anti-Albanian sentiment to fuel his political gain. A new era of persecution began in 1989. He came along, abolished completely the aut autonomy of Kosovo by closing all schools in Albanian language. The whole of the administra administration which was running Albanian language was closed and put in Cyrillic and Serbian language. The, the press, the TV station, everything was closed and everything was, has to be run in Serbian language and Cyrillic letters, which Kosovo was at that time over 90% of the population were Albanians. But obviously he came and said that you've got to accept the Serb, not the Yugoslav, but the Serb nation, that you are Serbs and not Albanians, and that's impossible. Peaceful protests were brutally crushed, whilst Dr. Ibrahim Rugova negotiated for Albanian human rights, and even before the war in Bosnia, he feared that any uprising would give Serbs the excuse to massacre Kosovo Albanians. The Democratic League of Kosovo tried in a peaceful way to convince the Belgrade government that we weren't interested of joining Albania, we weren't interested of, of actually splitting of Yugoslavia. The only people who split Yugoslavia, in fact, was the Serbian themselves. In the north, the Kosovo situation prompted moves to independence in Slovenia, Croatia, then Bosnia, where the Federal Army fought to save Yugoslavia, but blazing Serb nationalism, born of political rhetoric, saw war based on the region's complicated ethnic map. Serbian ideology envisaged a greater Serbia, embracing Serb communities outside the Republic, but double standards meant Kosovo's majority population had no right to self-rule whatsoever. Further south, Macedonia had fostered its own culture and was granted independence with little upheaval. Yugoslavia was now just Montenegro and Serbia, within which were two ethnically suppressed provinces. The dream of most Kosovars now was to live under Albania's flag, unification with the homeland, the birth of Kosovo. Warriors behind the dream were the Kosovo Liberation Army, a separatist guerrilla movement. That came as an opposition now to the Democratic League of Kosovo because they just seemed that in a peaceful way we are not getting anywhere. So the only way forward now is by getting arms in our hands and fight. The KLA or UCK in Albanian began ambushing Serb forces patrolling Kosovo. Naturally, the Yugoslav authorities endeavoured to root out the terrorists from within the communities, but extreme Serb retaliation gave rise to the NATO moral crusade, which ultimately led to war. Yugoslavia was soon viewed through the sights of NATO bombers. Early negotiations and ceasefires enabled persecuted ethnic Albanians hiding in the hills to return home, but atrocities against Kosovo civilians had continued. This was the response to Milosevic's refusal to accept NATO peacekeeping forces within Yugoslavia. Bombing began on the 24th of March 1999, NATO had backed negotiations with a credible threat of force, but the theory that Milosevic would capitulate within a few days proved to be ill-founded. For a staggering 78 days, he held out as NATO targeted his forces in Kosovo to protect innocent Kosovars, while Serbia itself felt the full force of NATO's moral imperative. Other early priorities were transport links. On the Serbian border, the railway from Mitrovica to Belgrade is severed at Mora. But there was tragic timing on the Belgrade to Skopje main line, when two missiles hit the Bistrički bridge just south of Gardelice. The Thessaloniki train was running late. Ten people lost their lives and 30 were injured. Cases of collateral damage were relatively few, but on the ground a new humanitarian disaster was unfolding. Villages were ablaze as Yugoslav forces embarked on ethnic cleansing. And those Albanians who were driven from their homes fled Kosovo. In Albania, when early refugee camps near the border couldn't cope with the crisis, this one was set up in the Tirana suburbs. The site in the capital was formerly a sports camp for athletic excellence. 444,600 Kosovars escaped to Albania, whilst others walked into Montenegro or Macedonia, where airlifts were undertaken to rehome them across Europe. In all, over 848,000 Kosovars fled the country, 
and as they left Yugoslav forces stripped them of all documentation to prevent their return. With no ID, proving their Yugoslav citizenship would be impossible when the war was over. A predominantly Serb-inhabited Kosovo was becoming a reality, but at what cost? Ongoing NATO airstrikes focused on Serbia's industry. With the economy in ruins and even Russia refusing to back Milosevic, he finally agreed to withdraw his forces from Kosovo. From the Serbian point of view, they were so fixed in their mind that the only way of achieving Kosovo to their own side by just killing and destroying anybody in Kosovo. They didn't fight soldier to soldier, but they went and killed women and children. And I think, to my view, that was a downfall. KLA did the best they could with, with what they've got, but what liberated Kosovo really is the, the, ble the bloodshed of innocent human beings, which the, the Serbs had no respect whatsoever. Barbed wire defences protect the multinational K4 peacekeeping force in the community Ila Is. For the troops posted here, the rebuilding of the shattered province is slow, as Serbian Albanian hatred is almost a culture and daily fracas often end in casualties, despite the presence of the peacekeepers. In the nearby streets of Kosovo Polje, troops pass every few minutes. Here, two communities, each with their own passionate belief that Kosovo is their ancient land, live side by side. But poisoned by politics and the events of the war itself, neighbours are sworn enemies. Kosovo Polje station is infamous as the departure point for deportation trains crammed with Albanians forced to abandon all, hoping their lives at least would be spared. Tragically, thousands pay the ultimate price, whilst others will pay for the rest of their days. Broken souls, perhaps, but the Kosovo Albanians firmly believed in NATO, whatever the consequences. United Nations mandate 1244 gave birth to KFOR, the NATO-led Kosovo Protection Force, which arrived on June 12, 1999, to keep the peace and endeavour to restore normality. Upon liberation, thousands returned home, but many villages were just ashes. For the homeless, international aid flooded in by Macedonia and Albania, the latter hampered by poor cross-border links, as well as Kosovo's own broken road system. Across Europe, people rallied to address the humanitarian crisis. In Britain, the rail industry was urged, don't miss the train for life. Two former railway public affairs managers, Neil Howard and John Morris, hoped to galvanise the compassion of railwaymen across Europe to deliver British aid to Kosovo as soon as possible. But some of Britain's privatised rail companies were already doing their bit for Kosovo. At Stoats Nets Junction, a Royal Observer Corps heads it down Gatwick Express. With the Getex Class 73s living on borrowed time, owner Sportabrook Leasing of Derby decided to remove the nameplates and crests from these dedicated machines. Swept along by Derby's Pro Kosovo fever, the proceeds from the subsequent auction on the 30th of July would be handed to Derby, aid for Kosovo. A few weeks later, the same engine, one of six donors, rushes through Croydon. Sadly, in Britain's national interest, the Railway Heritage Committee stopped the sale of the prime lots, the nameplate of ex royal train local broadlands. Nevertheless, about £50,000 was raised for a very needy nation, and the aid purchased would travel to it on the train for life, which, although planned just a few miles from here, had unrivaled international experience. In Hungary, mainline steam rail tours for international tourists flourished after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The Buffaloes were the regular attraction on Neil Howard's Imperial Express and Imperial Explorer duties, tours which provided him with invaluable experience and the friendship of influential Hungarian railwaymen under Sendre. Between them, the former Eastern Bloc would be no problem, but getting through the Channel Tunnel was another matter. English, Welsh and Scottish Railway, with a monopoly on rail freight through the tunnel from Britain, was essential to the plot. Freights for the continent depart Dolan's Moor daily. However, despite the humanitarian motive, EWS were interested and were blind to the PR benefits of running a complete train in its striking colours across most of Europe. Perhaps most galling, though, was its motive power situation. With these arriving by the shipload, other still healthy engines were being stored. 
All train of events required was one, or perhaps two of these, in the path out of the country. Without it, the train for life was going nowhere. A letter was even sent to EWS regarding the purchase of surplus engines, but as there was no response, the motive power search led to the preservationists. Initial negotiations suggested that a pair of class 50s could be used. Fearless, passing through Harold Wood, was one of four contenders, but the owner's enthusiasm faded when K4 asked to retain locals for three months to haul aid around Kosovo. As K4 could offer no assurance regarding when locals might return or in what condition, all owners backed out. What's more, by courting preservation, was train of events fanning rail industry rumours that the scheme was fanciful. D9000 was offered as compensation for the UK leg, but clearly well-meaning offers of heritage tractions sent cloudy messages to other sponsors. Locals from a real railway company were needed. Direct rail services of Carlisle entered the arena in May as humanitarian heroes when all seemed bleak. One of only four train operating companies with the required freight safety case certification it was also in the luxurious position of having spare engines. Direct Rail Services is a new company and we have a can-do culture. We were established in 1995, we're now a 10 million turnover company in those few short years and our approach is that trains should be running across Europe, aid should be going out there to help these countries and we think the rail service is definitely the right way to do it. So what we want to do is help with that, we want to make sure it happens and we want to give it all our skill and attention. A typical DRS train with a class 37 and 20 combination departs from Dorchester with a Winfrey nuclear flask. In the aftermath of British rail privatisation, Britain's nuclear industry created the DRS to cater for its special transport needs, but it also hauls hazardous chemicals and the occasional rail tour. One of the six DRS 37s was soon offered for the trip to Kosovo along with the four-man support team. With at least a dozen other railway men likely to travel, passenger accommodation was another issue. Initial plans involved the collection of Mark IIs and Threes, with Mark I BGs for the eight, but this entire rake fell foul of strict channel tunnel guidelines. Was this the answer? Back in 1995, two of the Class 37s, which later joined DRS, sweep through Water Autumn on a night start test. European night services were abandoned before inauguration, so this night start stop was technically available. Beside Eurostars and Le Shuttle, these are the only British coaches built to Channel Tunnel specifications. But as passenger use over rail track was never approved, train of events could only use them if they paid for expensive proving runs. That was not an option, so Eurostar and the Hungarians jointly solved the problem and the final operation plan was issued. After loading at the MOD base in Bista, Friday the 13th of August would see a pure freight train depart for Ditkert on a standard EWS pathway. In a dramatic U-turn, EWS came on board, although a single direct rail services loco would still hold the train, and from Ditkert to Dolans Moor, it would be a DRS freight. Eurostar UK Limited offered free passage for the support crew from Waterloo, a Thales delivering the crew to Aachen, was the eighth portion would travel in a standard international freight through the tunnel across France and Belgium into Germany. At Aachen, the train formation would be completed with more aid wagons and the passenger vehicles, the Deutsche Bahn taking over as the lead railway through Germany, the Czech Republic and Slovakia to Sturovo, the Slovak border point for Hungary. A 24-hour operation was timetabled in view of the humanitarian urgency. Across Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria and Greece, the lead railway would be MAV, the Hungarian state railways. The massive detour was necessary to avoid hostile Serbia. Kosovo had to be approached by Macedonia. Across Europe, rail operators were asked to provide motive power or a driver conducted to guide a volunteer train for life driver at the controls of the British engine. However, as fluent English was crucial, less westernised countries such as Bulgaria proposed to use their own locos. Former Yugoslav territory would be entered at Jovjelia, although there would be little contact with the local Macedonian railway, the smallest fragment of the former Yugoslav railway, the JZ. 
for the trip across Macedonia and into Kosovo, the UK Military Railway Authority would oversee the train for life, delivering it to Kosovo Polje, where the aid would be distributed. Everything was set. But in London, all was not well. Joint organiser John Morris reports with the latest unbelievable news. Someone in the military was bucking. Well, here we are on the 12th of August outside the Ministry of Defence building in Whitehall. This being the day when the train for life should have been underway. Unfortunately, a minor civil servant in the building behind us has found out about our plans and has instructed the British Army and the other forces not to cooperate with us. The military retreat remains unexplained, and with planes in this array, Field Marshal the Viking Alan Brooks' legendary expertise would have been useful. However, Sir Humphrey had merely made the team more determined. Far from the streets of London, the Balkan winter was getting ever closer was across Britain warehouses full of aid were waiting to be loaded. With MOD sites now unavailable for loading, a facility close to Derby was sought. Whilst back in Carlisle, things had changed too. The delay effectively bought more time to offer a better option for the K4 rail-based humanitarian aid programme. Inside these workshops, two locomotives were now being prepared for the trip to Kosovo, DRS engineers working on them in their own time. Former Hanslet Barclay class 20s emerged as the most practical option. Unused since their weed killing activities ended in 1996, the 6 killer 20s, as they were often known, had found a new home with the RS, although they weren't actually required in the short term, at least not in Cumbria. However, in the Balkans, there would be a godsend. <laughs> Once overhauled, the nominated machines 20, Nano 2 and 3 were dispatched to crew to receive the RS livery. September the 14th. The mercurial plan now embraced five DRS class 20s. 315 and 313 are given the Onesover and Kingmore before departing with the inaugural leg of the train for life from Carlisle to the Midland Railway Centre near Ripley. Meanwhile, 37612 was rounding up three class 20s for the trip to Kosovo itself and was presently hauling 20 Nano 2 and 3 to crew where the latest recruit 901 would be collected. The master plan was coming together. We've decided to send our head of operations, Neil McNicholas, to coordinate everything and make sure it runs as smoothly as possible. We also have decided to send two fitters with the team, just in case anything goes wrong with the locomotives and rolling stock en route. There's Tony Bush, who's our maintenance supervisor, and we have a chap called John Scott, who's one of the fitters. We asked for volunteers because we knew that it would be outside what we would normally ask people to do. Perhaps some of the risks were greater than we would normally ask people to take. But through one reason or another, we came down to the four people that will actually go along with the venture. Well, basically, we looked at what other skills people were bringing along from other organisations, and we decided on what we would need to bring along to balance up that, particularly on the maintenance side and to enhance the driver team with a bit more specialist knowledge about the locomotives themselves. These Lakers would only haul the English sector of the train for life from Carlisle to the Channel Tunnel Freight Terminal at Dolans Moor, whilst the other three would meet the 8th train at Calais. The trio had to be dragged to France as they'd been drained of fuel to comply with Channel Tunnel Fire Prevention Protocol. The underslung AWS equipment had also been removed rather than risk fouling the incompatible continental system. The DRS train for live driver was Mark Scheel. Class 20 is at his regular traction, but he doesn't usually need his passport when driving off shed. Mark's based at Carlisle. Uh, his normal driving life would be driving the nuclear trains between Sellafield, Carlisle, uh, Hunterston, Torness, Hartlepool, and basically as far south as Crewe on the West Coast Main Line. Other train operating companies in the UK are also sending drivers. Virgin Trains are sending one and EPS are sending two drivers to work shifts and everything transporting across Europe. Each individual country, they're responsible for the train while it's in their area and they decide how the train is going to be operated. So some countries have decided, yes, we'll hold the train with one of our locomotives and others have said, OK, you drive your own train, you have your own engines and we'll provide uh, a conductor to help you. Language is not going to be too much of a problem. The uh, continental countries have said that they'll lay on an English-speaking conductor driver. I can speak some French anyway, so that helps, but I think there's a lot of German involved, and I don't know any German. And I have a little bit of German, but uh, other than that, we're going to have to rely on the people that are coming along with us and anybody who may be available to translate. 
Six empty cargo wagons are coupled to the locos before symbolic bag of aid was added. The rest would be loaded in Derbyshire. The DRS donation, of course, was the loan of the other three engines. Our intention is to send three locomotives to Kosovo, not only because they will give security of transport through Europe, but also when they get to Kosovo, the three locomotives will be engaged on a 12-week period with the MOD for transporting aid around the country. What we're really doing is starting to rebuild the future in Kosovo. My understanding is a lot of the, the equipment will be school equipment, desks and papers and pencils for the children, so we're building the future and especially the children. I mean, Cumbria has looked after the families of Kosovans when they came here. We're now actually taking the aid out to them. And the fact it's going all the way by train is amazing, really. As the longest ever rail journey from Britain, the train was heading for the record books and uncertain territory. Some of it might be quite distressing to us. We're ready for that. We've uh, psyched ourselves up to, we're going into a, a very desperate area. There are desperate people there who need a lot of help and that's why we're doing the project. There is quite a bit of trepidation about what we're about to do. I think it's the unknown uh, more than anything. I mean, there are a lot of stories that come out of places like Kosovo. Whether they are true or not, it's difficult to validate. I'm sure we'll get there. Uh, I'm sure there'll be problems on the way. Uh, I'm sure there'll be problems crossing some of the borders. But I think with the weight of the people involved behind it and the people out in Kosovo helping us towards them, I'm very confident that we'll get there. At 15.27, the train for life leaves Carlisle for the trip down the West Coast Main Line as far as Litchfield Trent Valley, where the little used curve to the high level route was taken as the sun set. Driver Gordon Ogden eases the train onto the South Staffordshire Line towards Winchnor Junction. The three Kosovo bound locos have been united at Crew Heritage Centre, where 2901 had just been repainted, and were now journeying south towards the Brent Yard, ready to join a standard EWS international service between Wembley and Calais. The first expected use would be in the Czech Republic. As for this train, it would diverge right at Stenson Junction, passing Toton as it headed for Codner Park Junction and the Midland Railway Centre. The DRS duo would spend the next few days here whilst the train was loaded. On Thursday the 16th, Atkins and Sons of Findern delivered one of five 40-foot containers full of humanitarian aid, which had amassed in its four warehouses around Derby, courtesy of Derby Aid for Kosovo, who soon arrived by minibus. This tremendously successful outfit took on the responsibility for loading the train at Swanee Junction, its enthusiastic volunteers about to endure the second gruelling day and Sharp, Rose Millwood and Wendy Burge handle last-minute arrivals. All clothes donated were sorted into Winton summerwear and boxed accordingly for men, women and children. The group even rounded up aid from Kidderminster and Exmouth, whilst other organisations from Reading and Emsworth also coordinated deliveries to Swanwick ready for loading, with a little help from the railway itself. The two juggernauts delivered around 80 tonnes of equipment from Aid Direct International for Pristina Hospital and an orphanage. Positivity was the key as the second wagon was soon full, a familiar looking diesel performing the shunt. Class 20, formerly known as the English Electric Type 1, is the most successful locomotive born of the British Railway's 1955 modernisation plan. This one, the second of 228 built, had a particularly varied career. Retired into preservation, it was then used during the construction of the Channel Tunnel before returning to preservation. The last major operator of the class is DRS, although their engines have generally received massive life extension refurbishments. The second loaded van joined the first behind the DRS locos where an HM customs official sealed it up. In theory, the next time this needed to be opened would be in Kosovo. Right, that's that all sealed up. <laughs> Disappointingly, the previous day, the nature of loads like this resulted in only one and a half wagons being loaded. Today, the total would have to be four and a half. The pressure was on, but in different weather was not helping. Keep coming. 
Maneuvering the lorry closer would hopefully keep more boxes dry, speed up the operation and make it easier to check for explosives. No! Every single package was checked, standard channel tunnel precautions. Amongst the Derby aid workers was Bish. My name is Zbigniew Wojcik. My basic role is to organise uh, the press and also to coordinate the convoys that have gone out from Derby aid for Kosovo, which was set up in November of last year as an education group for the Pristina University and also to help some of the Kosovan refugees that were here in Britain that had fled from Kosovo. In April we then formulated the group related to humanitarian need when the conflict started to take place and the war in Kosovo was taking place. Um, since then we have managed to organise altogether nine lorries to go out to Albania and then into Kosovo to take the humanitarian aid. Really our campaign has been to keep the focus of Kosovo in mind with as many people as possible and to get as much aid as we possibly can to the Kosovan people themselves. And so that's why we are supporting this operation. Dabiet for Kosovo gave £5,000 to assist with train for life running costs. This represented a saving of around £15,000 on the equivalent road journey. Perhaps the most unusual load originated with children's aid. This playground would soon be enjoyed by Macedonian orphans and would travel in its own wagon to be dropped off when the train for life passed through Skopje. An EWS load supervisor endeavoured to secure it in one of the cavernous cargo wagons. This recognised international wagon type replaced the proposed parcel vans that fell foul of channel tunnel restrictions. The Midland Railway Centre staff chipped in with assistance, just as the railway had helped out when four previous possible loading points fell by the wayside. With the train loaded, the DRS engines draw into the adjacent station, more used to steam haul trains than something of this ilk, but this was only part of the story. Meanwhile, the British Army were loading another nine wagons in Mockengladbach, Germany, and in France, the other three Class 20s had arrived in Calais, albeit about 12 hours late. The DRS locals were sent on ahead of the train to undertake a French fitness to run exam on Friday. Saturday was impossible as the required SNCF staff were either on a holiday or at a wedding. Back in Derbyshire, Swanwick's convenient platform would assist Tony Boston with the application of sponsors' logos. Speaker's Gil Kay's involvement, specialist in locks and safety equipment, illustrates how the whole of the rail industry embraced the project. Further afield, rail operators across Europe offered free or discounted rates for their assistance. The Trans-European tour would start tomorrow. John Morris. You know, whatever your thoughts about the European community, these passports really are a godsend. It means that we can go anywhere in Europe without any paperwork. For former Eastern Bloc, however, this is just some of the paperwork that's been required to make our team of around about 20 people cross the many borders involved. I'm outside the Romanian Embassy, I'm just about to go in now to have the final part of the jigsaw, our all valuable Romanian visas, put into our passports. Doubters were about to be proved wrong. With luck, the train for life would cross Romania next Wednesday and arrive in Kosovo on the Saturday. What's more, it was already heading for London. The 6Z63 passes through Wilmicote, running about 90 minutes down, due to someone mistakenly taking the Kodna Park Junction train star back to Toto. Just beyond here, the driver was contacted by rail track control in Birmingham and asked if he signed the road via Camp Hill, Deliford Curve and Birmingham New Street. He did, so the train for life was rerouted and actually arrived early at Kensington Olympia, where crowds were out in force for an official waving off ceremony. For the record, the booked route beyond Water Autumn was via Sutton Park, Bescott, Aston, Stetchford, and then West Coast Mainline to Kenny O. DRS MD Max Jewell was soon in the cab doorway as the press questioned his driver, Richard Bresley, a distant relative of Sir Nigel. With only 14 minutes booked and a host of sponsors present, protocols were rather hasty. Sir John Guinness, BNFL chairman, prepares to give the right away. On the opposite platform, the press were also out in force, as Argon Lojeha, president of Kosovo Aid International, gives his support. The fantastic train for life voyage restarts.
Direct rail services would deliver the train to EWS International at Dolans Moor, who are now the lead railway from there to Germany. A far cry from the early days of this interest. Yes, this train did upset some of the old school, and many thought it would never run. But as the rails through Shortlands and Skopje are the same gauge, and these Lakers are fueled with humanitarian passion, the train for life was born to succeed. Lives depended on it. Soon the train would pass through Bromley, hometown of GE Capital Rail Services, who supplied the wagons at no charge. On arrival at Dolans Moor, they would be inspected, ready to pass through the Channel Tunnel on the EWS-operated 7 minutes past midnight Wembley to Colon service. Having left the wagons at Dolans Moor, 2313 and 315 awaited the next duty at Ashford, the job done. Across the Channel, at Calais Fratton Yard, the next train for life milestone was booked for around 3 a.m. The three Kosovo bound class 20s would be added to the front of the joint EWS, SNCF and SNCB Wembley to Cologne freight ready to depart at 0704. By sunrise, the six eight wagons had only just arrived in a Calais yard on what is normally a Eurotunnel light engine path. Evidently, the Cologne service was running late, but with about four hours booked at Fretton, it was virtually back on time as the first loco dropped on to depart. Soon after, the line from Calaville joins, before the routes diverge to Dunkirk or Hasbrook, in theory the next stop for the train. This SNCF Alston built electric came to the rescue after the Belgian Railway's dual voltage class 12 disgraced itself upon coupling to the class 20s. Passage for the DRS engines and associated wagons from Dolans Moor to Aachen was at no charge to the train for life operators. The car carriers were the only fair paying portion of the service on this occasion. Sadly, an 80 km per hour speed restriction imposed on the class 20s would slow progress and soon a brake problem on the Lille main line would bring things to a standstill for about an hour. All the signs pointed to a torrid journey for the two DRS onboard troubleshooters. Meanwhile, the rest of the Train for Life team assembled for the journey of their lives. Until this moment, many had never met before. Until near Howard, the driving force behind the scheme. This was a rare public appearance and he's been locked away for weeks, sorting out clearances, timetabling, insurances and general red tape. Eurostar driver Mick Lockyer seems at home as the passports complete with Romanian visas are returned to their owners. When all reasonable train for life passenger vehicle options were banned from the Channel Tunnel, a Eurostar ride to Brussels was donated to get the crew out of the country. Beyond suburbia, the Eurostar cruises through the Garden of England at Paul Hill. On the train we've got representatives from DRS. In fact, we've got the whole crew here, really. We've already had some drama, though. We've uh, left Major John Points behind because his passport was still locked up in the Romanian Embassy, and uh, he'll be following a couple of hours behind us. There's also been a minor problem with an air leak on one of the 20s, basically because our friends on the French Railways didn't read the instructions that were sent to them. But that all that's been sorted now. Um, when we get to Arken, we should have a full train waiting for us. John Thompson, Virgin Trains Route Operations Manager North East, will this week take turns with his men, driving Class 20s across Europe. Mark Scheel of DRS joins the Eurostar drivers, whilst his colleague Neil McNicholas troubleshoots by phone and the press eavesdrop. <laughs> Speeding through Pedak Wood, it's worth considering the historic significance of the Train for Life safety case. Designed after EWS refused to help, it dovetailed the DRS freight into SNCF tunnel operation, thereby shattering the EWS tunnel monopoly. Cynics say it inspired the U-turn. Safety officer Andrew Pierce, author of the document, demonstrates steam rail tour headgear. On the final approach to the Channel Tunnel, Train for Life engineer Ray Towell and Neil Howard enjoyed the moment. Astonishingly, any problems caused by former communist countries ahead were minor compared to getting this far. Beyond the tunnel, the passenger route would be to Brussels for a change onto Thales service to Aachen. 
The freight route from Calais was via Hasebrook, Lille, Aulnoy, Jumont, Namur and Liège to Aachen. Lille, La Deliverance, was one of numerous yards which the DRS travelling engineers had to endure as the catalogue of local failures and fraught misunderstandings slowed progress. Tony and I had the job of accompanying the low cost through France and Belgium, but due to the different braking systems and different air systems on the low cost, we encountered quite a lot of problems. We couldn't get the continental people to understand why we needed the two different pipes connected. They didn't speak English, we didn't speak French or Belgian or German. So it left a lot of problems. This was no backpacking holiday for DRS. Neil McNicholas looked somewhat anxious whilst waiting for connection to Aachen at Brussels Midi, where the doyen of Class 16s arrives, sporting the name of model manufacturer Merklin. The stylish B logo is preferred to initials, as Belgian and National Railways translates into SNCB or NMBS, depending on which local language is used, French or Flemish. The tight connection from Eurostar to Thales fell victim to French signalling. On board, Tony Boston gives Mark Shield the lowdown on a few of the differences between UK and continental mainland signalling. Further up the coach, Belgian railways were unknowingly providing the power to John Thompson's video batteries. The overworked phones were next, although half the early calls were on borrowed phones chasing up why international barring hadn't been lifted. Right. Are you going to be able to get some food or not? Neil's heads for overload. Right. Okay, see you then. Mm. They've got another local car change to do, apparently, on the Belgian border. The Liège stop at 16.11 coincided with the proposed arrival time at Aachen for the Class 20s and UK aid. But the call from Tony Bush on the locos revealed he wasn't expecting to pass through here until 9pm, the planned departure time from Aachen. What's more, at 7pm a press photo call was booked. Thankfully, some people are reliable. Neil Howard's friends from Mev Nostalgia were waiting in Aachen with two coaches brought from Budapest, already coupled to the second portion of the eight train. Nine wagons originated in Menken Gladbach and delivered on time by the German railway, Deutsche Bahn. After a fraud day, it was a reassuring sight for the arriving team to watch the third and final coach being added to the train, even if the yard pilot didn't seem to have anyone at the controls. Close inspection revealed this to be the driver. With the coach moved out of the way, the British team collect their luggage as the diesel hydraulic remote control Rangier Loke shuns the unique livery former East German Railways Deutsche Reisbahn Cochette. Provided by the DB, along with the nine wagons for aid delivery, this coach would be home for these railway men for the next eight days or so. Large cases encouraged by fluid return arrangements. K4 would fly the group home from Kosovo at its convenience. With two two compartment though, things went too crowded and walk down to Hungarian restaurant car was very encouraging. The professional railway men were to be well treated. Ray's just looked at the, the brakes as well yeah. on that second wagon. Yeah. His opinion is they're yeah. okay to yeah. Berlin, yeah. but then no, yeah. not yeah. after Berlin. It's actually about uh, 24 millimetres of block left. Well, here we are in the Marston Yard at uh, Arkham. We're just about to have our first meal inside this, this beautiful coach. This is very nice, uh, so fingers crossed we'll have the same kind of uh, thing all the way. Dinner was interrupted by numerous passing trains. Sadly, this one was still hours away. As the light fades, the Wembley to Colon freight approaches Namur, with the Belgian Railways Class 51 in charge, but not for long it expired with traction motor flashovers at Liège, where missing paperwork also hindered the handover to the Germans. Moving the train for life from Calais to Aachen West under the umbrella of EWS International had been disastrous with around 12 locomotive changes. 
the freight lost about an hour every time. So now, the two halves of the A train were apparently destined to spend the night in the separate yards in Aachen, unlikely to be united until daybreak. Despite this setback, a scaled-down press visit was underway in the carriage sidings near Aachen Hauptbahnhof with Brigadier Campbell, his wife Phoebe and other leading lights of K2K. Kit to Kosovo is the humanitarian aid effort of families of British forces in Germany who supplied the aid already coupled to the train. Shortly after 5 a.m., the unmistakable sound of class 20s shattered the silence. 901, then the 903 lifted the spirits, although not of the locals who only took about four minutes before telephoning the depot staff to complain. Fortunately for the neighbors, the DRS engines were soon silenced as a DB class 140 pilot engine appeared out of the night and the complete train for life, three class 20s, three coaches and 15 wagons was soon on its way into Aachen Hauptbahnhof, albeit about 15 hours late. At 06.15 on Sunday the 19th, the 24-hour train for life operation began and soon its first night turned to day. Rushing towards Berlin, the Westfalen plane provided unspectacular breakfast viewing. Late arrival Major John Points of Health and Safety Executive catching up on socializing, whilst others began the regular train for life game, where are we? Neil Howard was in a reflective mood. Well, I'm glad to say that we were out of the hands of English, Welsh and Scottish Railway, because the best you can say is they were having a very bad day. And it's been very sad to see how this train was operated from the UK as far as the Belgian border with Germany. They were very kind and they did this for nothing, but they have a monopoly on channel tunnel traffic and they would have been conspicuously out of kilter with the rest of Europe's railways if they hadn't helped us. What I'd like to know, and I'm sure they want to know, is why this went so wrong. Paperwork was astray, inspectors were doing very strange things, imposing restrictions on the locomotives when their maximum speed had been agreed in advance. And I think if anybody looks at the last 24 hours, they'd be profoundly ashamed to call themselves railwaymen. One of the interesting dimensions towards the end of the night and the early hours of the morning when we were still separated from the locomotives, they were still in Belgium, we were in Narken Yard, was how the rumour machine went into overdrive. There was supposed to be no driver, there was supposed to be no pilot locomotive. In the end, as soon as the locomotives were handed to the Germans, they responded immediately, they sent a driver, they moved them to Arken Hauptbahnhof Yard and two inspectors came back from Cologne in their own cars. They were called out at three o'clock in the morning they went through the legal measures that the Germans need to permit foreign locomotives to run on their railway. They were positive, they were proactive, and we went. I was woken up at about five past three uh, in order to undertake with the two German engineers the fitness to run exam, only to find that they were extremely thorough in what they were about to do with all the technical data. And we found ourselves at half past three in the morning measuring every flange thickness on all 320s. They didn't find anything awry and we passed off the locos fit to run uh, after about an hour and a quarter, a very, very thorough exam in the middle of the night at Arken. So with some strong coffee to keep everyone going, the train was now cleared to run all the way to the Greek-Macedonian border. The team had responded well to initial problems, although the other two DRS men were still sleeping of the French nightmare. Well, I think it's certainly a question of first blood is to the train of events team. They did incredibly well. If you're going to run a train through 11 countries, 11 different languages, 11 different rule books, that's a serious problem. And serious problems need serious people to fix them. I've been in the railways for 20 years and I've been able to draw on quite a pool of people and I've chosen what I consider to be the very best railwayman in Britain. I have to confess, I'm an old friend of John Morris, one of the organisers. I'm curator operations up at York at the NRM and I uh, was actually out shunting and I tend to spend a lot of time doing that sort of thing. I was at the uh, Northampton Commercial Boat Rally and he turned and said to me, Tony, how's your route knowledge to Macedonia? This was back in May. I said, I beg your pardon? Suddenly the mobile phone rang and it was Neil Howard. Hadn't heard from him for quite some time. Used to deal with him when he was in the special trains unit and he said, uh, good morning Ray. Um, how do you fancy uh, spending a week taking a relief train uh, to Kosovo? I really didn't believe I thought such a project could never be undertaken. 
and I thought about it for about 20 seconds and said, yeah, I'd really like to do that. <laughs> it's changed a few times, I must admit, the plans since then, but then these pioneering projects do. But uh, as soon as you explained the plan to me, that was it. I was hooked. So on the day I received a letter from Neil Howard asking if I could assist him in any way, I also received a fax copy of the letter he had sent to the German Railway asking me if I knew about it, if I would translate the letter for them and if I had any comments to make about it. I first of all realised that I had a marvellous chance here to get the K2K kit to Kosovo that had been collected by the British Army in Mönchengladbach. So I spoke to my headquarters, explained what I would like to do, and they told me to go on and do it. And I then contacted the German Railway and said to them that, yes, I did know about Train for Life and that we were also involved in it. That gave them, uh, I think, the assurance they needed to decide to become involved themselves. I said that we would be very pleased if the German Railway could see their way to doing this at no cost. A decision which had to be made by the top level and they decided that that's exactly what they do. Troop trains and army freight workings make Joyce the biggest operator of passenger specials and the third largest freight customer for the DB. But as we approach the former East German border, it seems her influence goes way beyond Germany, prompting a rethink of Neil Howard's initial proposed route. His first suggestion was that they travelled through Germany to Austria and then from Austria into Hungary. But since I, on behalf of the army, deal with the Czech Republic and the Slovak Republic, when we go to Bosnia or when we go to Kosovo, I suggested to him that that might be uh, a better alternative, and he agreed. Joyce also persuaded the Czechs and Slovaks to waive a Czech access fees, and overall saved the train of events more than £20,000. Furthermore, she had unrivaled experience having planned potential British Army rail moves to Kosovo from the summer of 98, and lost count of deliveries shipped to Thessaloniki for transportation to Pristina. However, the train for life route via Romania, Bulgaria, Greece and Macedonia had only been tried once. Magdeburg's French Gothic-style cathedral is architecturally about all this city has to offer post-World War II, so we won't linger. The trip from Aachen via Mönchengladbach, Hamm, Mindun, Haste, the Hanover avoiding line and within ICE turbulence brought the train around 500 kilometers with barely a pause. But now it was time for ear defenders. Naturally, with so few stops, the onboard photographers were keen to capitalize and actually get a daylight shot of the pilot engine. The DB cargo livery was threatened as the Germans were already in cahoots with the Dutch to create a new pan-European freight company to take on open access competition. Not at her pitch, the conductor guard from Aachen was likely to worry. After seeing a lifetime of changes on the railway, his retirement was only three months away. After an impromptu of Widerzen, the next principal stop would be in Berlin, where an official DB reception awaited the train for life. Nearby, an ex-East German diesel hydraulic rests between duties. Since Germany's reunification, this line into Berlin, from the former East German border at Helmstedt, has enjoyed major investment. It's now fully electrified and doubled throughout, with the line speed increased to 160k, although 62 miles per hour, 100k, was all the British locos were cleared for. At Flughafen berlin schoenfeld Berlin's airport station, Class 112 pacing was undertaken. The train for life had continued on the Berlin main line as far as the Potsdam outskirts where it diverged onto the Ring to this point, the single track link to Berlin-Lichtenberg. The train effectively circumnavigated Berlin in an anti-clockwise direction. Built by the communist run Deutsche Reichsbahn as an extension of the now one to Orianenburg line, the 105 km Ozenring physically encircled Berlin, echoing the post-war communist zone. 
Following the German surrender in 1945, the country was split into British, French, American and Soviet spheres of influence. However, with much of the communist Germany physically west of Berlin, the Ausering passing above ensured that no DR services would traverse any part of capitalist Berlin. Now heading G west, we parallel the Muchberg line. The 1961 completion of the Ausenring and associated link lines just preceded the direction of the Berlin Wall, which severed 11 of the 14 railroads crossing the city, including those of the S-Bahn commute operation, then run by the DER, but now a subsidiary of the DB, the railway effectively created by the Western powers post-World War II. Drawing into Lichtenberg, it's sobering to consider that for nearly 30 years, the side of Berlin was the other side of the wall, it surprised dismantling in 1989, heralding a new dawn for Germany, and with it, new challenges for the railways, which officially reunited on New Year's Day 1994 as the Deutsche Bahn. The train for life German experience had done nothing to sully the image of an ultra-efficient DB poised for another rebranding. DB becomes D-Bahn, the railway. In the cab of the Class 140, the driver prepares to receive a diesel pilot as a Class 219 arrives from the west. Meanwhile, down the platform, a photo opportunity of British Army, train of events and DB officials beckoned, as Mark Scheel and John Thompson look on. But there's a little hesitation from major points when the Class 345 drops onto the train. As a principal Train for Life sponsor, DB also invited the Train of Events team to view its enormous building work underway in the city, including the new Lieta Stadt Bahnhof Central Station and underground North South Line, due for completion in 2004. The alternative was a trip with the DRS team and their Class 20s to the nearby diesel depot, a matter of a few hundred metres away. With the Lichtenberg pilot coupled up, the driver switches controls ready for the trip to the depot, the locomotives already uncoupled from the train. Round here, a power wheel rather than a power handle is the norm. DR Class 105 pilot is at the head of the bizarre five-engine ensemble, with one DB cargo electric and three English electric Type 1s. After 40 years of successful operation in Britain, they now had another amazing chapter of history to write, how they conquered Eastern Europe. Trained of fuel five days early in Carlisle, Lichtenberg Shed would be the important refueling stepping stone for the potentially unassisted run across the Czech Republic and Slovakia into Hungary. From Aachen, the train for life had operated as a DB freight, the official Berlin visit encouraging the somewhat indirect route across Germany, but also offering the DB a chance to impress the captive UK journalists while the essential Class 20 preparation was undertaken. Fortunately, the DRS engineers were Forsprung Deutsch Technik, the head of technology. The pump may be metric, but is locos recently decorated by EWS melodrama are imperial 4 feet 8 and a half inch gauge, built with a 380 gallon fuel tank positioned within the footplate. That's 1,727 litres in mainland Europe. Whoops. I hope diesel's cheap around here. Fortunately, the original fuel capacity on 20, 9, 2 and 3 had been increased during the weed killing era. The addition of a pair of tanks mounted on a footplate boosted capacity to 4,727 litres, although the filler cap on 9, 2 seems reluctant. For the photographers, another milestone was fitting the headboard, donated by Newton Replicas. Special brackets had been made for 9, 3. One other job remained though, turning the engine for it to lead the train for life, requiring another shunt to the turntable. 346706 was a standard DR type, built over 23 years and identical to the pilot used from the station. The Class 20, servicing on this former Eastern Bloc depot, would see them through to the Hungarian capital, Budapest. 
Back in May 1989, Hungary was in the light of Mikhail Gorbachev's new Soviet non-interventionist policy in Eastern Europe, the first communist country to abandon border control with the West. The ensuing flood of around 5,000 East Germans a week entering Austria undermined the validity of the Berlin Wall. Even so, its symbolic fall on November the 9th accelerated a post-totalitarian communism domino effect, embracing virtually every country on the route of the train for life. Indeed, with the headboard reading like a humanitarian declaration of intent, British engines were hauling a massive aid train to a country irrevocably changed but tragically new nationalistic fervor promoted ethnic suppression. Back station, the DRS 20s and electric pilot pause as the train is propelled in, ready for departure. During the Berlin stop, DRS Supremo Mark Jewell also dropped by and perhaps inspired by the destination board, found himself buying around in McDonald's. Local servicing prevented his crew from eating for seven hours. Lichtenberg has fairly cosmopolitan destinations, but the 20 hundred hours to Kosovo Polje is definitely not in the timetable. Soon the train for life was passing a now familiar semi roundhouse en route to Dresden. With nothing but blackness outside, there was little distraction from eating until the vast local sheds on the approach to Dresden. Certain classes remain true to the east where 120k was usually the top speed. This route's 160k upgrade ringing the changes. Dresden is the most beautiful city in Germany, also the residents would have you believe. Certainly the principal station, Dresden Hauptbahnhof, is one of the most impressive scenes from the train for life. Three massive train sheds belie its through station status, its audacity extending to survival of the city's February 1945 Allied bombing. One of the 20 DB Skodas is the first sign of a monopoly ahead. Here, modern architecture nearly rivals Dresden's Baroque legacy of Augustus the Strong. As for the station, the outer train sheds cover three roads, with terminating platforms in the centre, the train for life arriving on a higher level, west side through lines, ready for a local change. British engines aside, a class 140 is rare here some consolation for losing the booked Class 103 from Aachen. The classic electric fell victim to the late-running EWS saga. With predictable German efficiency, the engine soon vanished, offering the first opportunity to photograph the Class 20s complete with headboard, train and chief engineer. Beautiful, thank you. A bit of posing, nothing like it. Also enjoying the spotlight was our old friend from Aachen, now returning home. As one of nearly 800 of its type in use, it probably rarely gets photographed. Official train for life photographer Bob Sweet realizes time is short as a replacement pilot engine approaches. A Czech Railways Class 372 would take the train into its homeland as far as Dietzin. Dresden is the regular electric changeover point, German and Czech overhead voltage differing. Although both railways can provide dual voltage traction. Despite the loco, the train for light was still under DB operation. From Dresden to Bad Schandau, the overhead supplies 15 kV AC, beyond there, 3 kV. In fact, the Czech class 372s and DB class 180s assist the fleet, the 35 engines being built specifically for the Berlin to Prague corridor. However, since the Berlin section was upgraded, these Czech locos are rare beyond Dresden. With the shunter taking just 26 seconds to couple up, it was soon time to go. The next stop would be in the Czech Republic, where Eastern oppression ended with the Velvet Revolution. The resignation of the Czechoslovak communist government, just 18 days after the fall of the Berlin Wall, paved the way for separate Czech and Slovak republics and separate railways. The CD Czeska Drache is a Czech railway, the ZSR Slovak. On New Year's Day 1993, the country split and so did the state-operated railway. After 73 years, the CSD and Czechoslovakia itself were both history.
Ahead was a trip of about 50 kilometers, the railway meandering with the river Elbe, all the way to the Czech border. Not much time then for train for life supporter Rainer Rodik, DB Cargo Director of International Relations, to make himself known with the help of Joyce Hughes. We've got Mihilik arriving in the Czech Republic, and I would actually like to introduce myself on German soil. <laughs> He values me very much. And uh, she had sich, yeah, schon fast zum Eisenbahner qualified. Um, <laughs> and he would consider me to be almost a real girl. <laughs> <laughs> Joking apart, Joyce and Herodic have been working together on pan-European military rail moves for nine years, and without their backing, the train for life wouldn't have got this far. Mementos were exchanged on the approach to country number five. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say something? We're about to arrive in Dechin. Just be a bit careful of bailing off the train here, because there will be a Czech border grip, especially with cameras, they might make things a bit nasty. Following the station passport checks, the train drew into the nearby yard. The Škoda Pila being removed, ready for the DRS locos to take centre stage. Diechin is at the confluence of five lines, about 12 kilometres inside the Czech Republic, and as such is the first stop for freights leaving the European community. Plenty of time then to prepare these class 20s for the most historic journey of their lives. Herodic joined the photographers, the train now under the auspices of the Hungarian Railway. But if the locals weren't happy with the paperwork, it wouldn't be going anywhere. Reassurance came at 1.25 a.m., a new sound for Central Europe. The English electric whistle. Obviously, you can't just turn up expecting to drive your own eighth train through a country. And even though prior arrangements were in place to do just that, it wasn't a case of start the locos and go, a Czech official climbing into 902. Train of events had already proved itself to be no fly-by-night operator. Forests of paperwork preceded the train's arrival to smooth transit. However, in cab gesticulation means trouble the Czechs doubting the locos' braking ability on the 740-ton train. A huge Roddick and Howard spearhead set about nursing the paperwork through as a cross-border of a city to Dresden piggyback truck service passes, a regular class 372 job. Diechin is an industrial river port on the Laba, Rich in mining history, this hilly area was part of Sudetenland, home for three million Germans split from the motherland by the 1919 creation of Czechoslovakia. A melting pot of unrest by 1938, Britain and France pushed through its giveaway to Hitler to prevent war. As photographers vie for the master shot, DRS complete the set. Sadly, paperwork dramas would squander another two hours. The alleged brake problem resolved by imposing an 80k speed limit on a train. 100 was previously agreed. With the OK to depart given, let's jump aboard 902 as the British engines claim new territory. Yes, a class 92 used the Czech test facilities at Villen before. Kestrel was sold to the Russians, but this was something else. Triple-headed class 20s depart for Prague. Beyond the yard, the real action started. Driver Tony Boston gives the engines a full hand. The piece of the first wayside station is about to be shattered. Behind the hills is sleepy Vlishnitsa, its handwritten timetable barely legible under feeble lighting.
the locals wanted a 20 past 4 alarm call. Travelling along the west bank of the Lava, the Czech name for the Elba, across the river another southbound train from Vietzin heads towards Litomirice in Kolin. On board, even the most enthusiastic souls couldn't find the inevitable, something to do with spending nearly four hours in Vietzin rather than the booked 25 minutes. In the Couchette too, nothing stirred. Dawn came as a train for life drew into Prague after about 140 kilometers of Class 20 haulage. It's widely recognized that the Czech capital is an essential stop for any Eastern European tour, although this unspectacular international station, even at sunrise, doesn't exactly do the city justice. Sadly though, as far as the Czech railways are concerned, it was an essential stop for this train, a pilot engine being provided from here. All the more criminal that so few appreciated the run from Djecin. Amongst four people saying goodbye were Joyce Hughes and Rainer Roddick, who escorted the train from Aachen and Berlin respectively, en route to a joint meeting with the Czech railway authorities. The hot news from the train for life also encouraged two journalists to disappear to meet the deadlines. Soon the arrival of a Czech railway's Pershing, bizarrely nicknamed after the American Cold War surface-to-surface -surface missile, brought an end to the whistling. The imposed ATK speed restriction had eased the Class 20s in gently, perhaps a good thing after a couple of years mothballed. Sadly though, as the electric hauled train passed over the Voltava, it became apparent that the unscheduled pilot was a direct result of the same restriction. Evidently, 100k was essential in the rush hour to avoid the train for life causing congestion. With the traffic building in the streets below and on the railway, the rush hour starts early around here. It's barely half past six. Ahead, a train from Nimburg direction heads for Prague's principal station, as the train for life takes the more colorful, but rather less attractive route, avoiding the beautiful city center to head due east. Well, it was a bit too early for sightseeing. Having skirted the northern periphery of the city, the spaghetti of junctions would bring the train to prague Lieben, where a class 451 EMU passes on a local service from perhaps Colleen. More importantly, Lieben is home for CKD, the Czech diesel equivalent to Škoda, the two companies fulfilling all Czech state railway needs until 1989. The works is over to the far left. Češka Trežebova is arguably the crew of the Czech Republic. The main Czech Kedraka diesel works over to the right as the train arrives. Rather disappointingly, the class 163 is still up front and would evidently haul the train to a point where its DC appetite could no longer be satisfied after about 160k. Thankfully, one of these multi-voltage machines wasn't provided. Being rather more versatile, it might have been harder to lose. Just to the south is the running shed the breakdown train indicating its strategic positioning. With an allocation of around 180 electric and 20 diesel locos, this is a prime location to illustrate what is probably Europe's most colorful railway. In theory, DC electrics are generally green, AC machines red and multi-voltage locos blue. Diesels enjoy a virtually anything goes livery policy. On the penultimate road of the first semi roundhouse is the unique 180002, one of two prototypes for the class 181s, 2s and 3s, some of which are seen at the back of the depot, looking somewhat down at heel. 10k further on, electrification is very recent, the signal aspect replicated on the dash. Built from 1986, this is the peak of Škoda local development. From Prague to just past Czeska Trzebova, the train traversed the first major Czech electrified route. Energized throughout by 1960, it extended via Zilina to Košice, close to the Soviet border. This is a short DC extension, built to meet the new 25 kV AC scheme extended from Brno, which along with Pilsen in the southwest, are AC strongholds at odds with the general DC network. Svitave, birthplace of humanitarian hero Oskar Schindler, would prove to be the end of the line for the rush hour pilot. At the next station, 
PAC system begins. The completion of the Czech State Railway Class 163 order collided with the post-1989 political changes, the collapse of the communist in-house trading policy and in Škoda's grip on the Eastern Bloc. Furthermore, the fall of Soviet-funded stability meant neither the new Czech nor Slovak railways could initially afford the last 60 locos, then going to Italy instead. Any future local construction is now doubtful, with 90% of Škoda now in Volkswagen hands. With the DRS locos once again fired up, it was time to depart for Budapest. the board 902 once again as the English electric bunchies are unleashed, albeit still at maximum 80k, not quite 50 miles per hour. Ahead was some of the Czech Republic's finest permanent way, the train progressing from Bohemia into Moravia, the humdrum looking town soon giving way to sweeping s -bends. The switch back through the Svitava Valley was truly emotive, as the train for life rattled the crockery on the dresser or two. Perhaps it was the first daylight running of the British Locos, perhaps the valley's cultural heritage, but there was something special, an inspiring feeling that this truly was an express train on a mission of humanitarian urgency. Rosrani's modern platforms, the first class formation and new electrification signpost the line's rise to international status. Limestone hills necessitate countless tunnels, but also provide one of the classic attractions of the area, the honeycomb of caves in the Moravian cast, just east of Blansko. A little further south, Adamov seems more likely to benefit from its international future than the other smaller communities in the valley. The Svitava Lani to Brno electrification was energized in January 1999 as part of European Corridor 4, the scheme to upgrade the entire route from Berlin to Dresden, Bratislava, Vienna and beyond. The next step for this line would be its use by international passenger traffic, diverted from its traditional route, the Colin to Brno direct line. This was due at the turn of the year, although with the seven Czech Pendolines anticipated to be working the services by then, running six years late, tilting trains might not grace this valley until 2003. Up front, the cab of 20 Nana 3 was rather full, local pilot men knowledge of the road ahead guiding the two UK drivers. On the power from Sitave was John Thompson, filmed by his partner driver Mick Fokje, who was just passing time before his first driving turn. This is Bilovice nad Svitavo. For those on board, it was difficult to appreciate the train for life's physical magnitude. Fifteen wagons of life-changing aid made it longer than a Eurostar. Within a few kilometers is Berna, often overlooked by tourists despite its rich cultural heritage. Once the capital of Moravia, it developed at the confluence of the Svetava and Svratka rivers. leaves of autumn fall, the train nears the Czech Republic's second city, where it would desert the direct and apparently most obvious cross-city route for a trip round the houses, a regular train for our pastime. 
In fact, anyone on board partial to unusual mileage would have a few treats this week. Generally, the route across the Czech Republic was the 454k international corridor from Děčin to Bratislav. But here, for instance, as the main line heads direct to Brno Židenice, the train diverges for an operational stop at Brno Malomržice. Behind the locos, the catenary of the route from Havlicko, Brod and Kolin is visible. The route destined to lose its international status to the upgraded Svitava Valley line, now passing beneath. Just beyond, Brno Malomerzice Starfall is the first of the two operational stops in the city, both very brief. In the neighboring yard is a Laminatka Electric, the nickname inspired by the laminate or fiberglass body, an award-winning design. Another Laminatka awaits departure from Brno Židenice, after which the route through Brno's principal station was avoided in favour of a trip through the eastern suburbs, enabling another stop at Brno Dolny, Brno Lower if you prefer. Still boasting an impressive station building, Dolny is now just a staff hall for a local shed. Shed a three class 242 AC electrics, sister locos to Laminatki, they're known as metal after their more conventional body shells. The curious diesels behind are goggles and a mini Hector. Beyond the Traversa, Bernadoni shed is typical. Water columns and a turntable still in situ despite the end of Czech steam operation in November 1980. Ahead, the single-track electrified route from Brno's main station crosses for Cerlice and Pržerov. At the controls, Mik Lokje settles in for his debut train for live drive, as the junction for Jeklava diverges right. The heavily graded goggles worked route is a favourite with British enthusiasts. Now back on the main line, the DRS engines cross over to resume right-hand running. Left-hand running only prevailed as far as Belgium. This route was opened in 1839 as the main line from Austria to Brno, Kaiser Ferdinand's Nordbahn. The Czech lands of Moravian Bohemia were under the oppressive rule of the Habsburg Empire from 1526 for nearly 400 years so the Czech railway system was developed under Austrian rule. This line was built under the reign of Kaiser Ferdinand V, the last pure Austrian ruler before breaking the Hungarian royal family, led to the creation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. The Czech and Slovak people's dream of self-rule was realized thanks to the Austro-Hungarian defeat of World War I. Czechoslovakia was born as a single federal state of two equal republics. Broken in World War II, they were reunited under communism and separated in its aftermath. 160 years after opening, this line is enjoying fantastic investment, although the ongoing permanent way upgrade features the inevitable glut of temporary speed restrictions. Three Czeska Drachista being provided to advise the British crew. Top and tailed tomcats on a ballast duty necessitate wrong line working and incomplete wires. The Czech government is ploughing 36.5 billion kruna into Jechin Bretzlav upgrade. That's about 650,000 million pounds. Another tomcat waits on cement train at Vranovice, where 8K branch from Bohorelice joins from the west. Despite the dilapidated infrastructure, the branch still sees 12 return trains daily. Sadly though, Czech rural branches are under threat of severe pruning. So 
soon the trip due south would come to a temporary end at the border town of Bretzlav. The ends dropping off the scale on the approach to the yard. The Austrian border is only about three kilometers away, directly south, and Slovak one about 10k to the east. But as the last Czech town of any size, it acts as a railway border crossing for both. Although traction inspector John Thompson fears the worst. I thought I said we'll get land in the back road of some yard, somebody from the two days. With a Lenjot stamp added to the passports to denote the actual exit route into Slovakia, the train was on the move after literally a few minutes. Mr. Thompson's scepticism would prove to be premature by about six countries. A mixed and engineering melee is another mini hectare and couple of electrification units. The distance station would be the final stop in the Czech Republic to drop off the last Czech pilot man. Evidently, he enjoyed the Class 20 experience. Just south of the station, the route to Slovakia diverges from the Vienna main line. An Austrian freight arrives moments before the train collide turns due east on the route built by the Royal Hungarian State Railways in 1900. Soon the train collide would be racing through Lanziot, a one horse town perhaps but did it justify a new passport stamp when Slovakia was divorced from the Czech Republic? Just to the east on the trunk route from Prague, the customs facilities aren't much better, the road being diverted through the middle of the old motorway services. The Morava River bridge ahead is the physical border between the countries, the train for life entering country number six. Ahoy Slovensko! Ciao Česka Republika! Bretzlav, a solo Slovak pilot man had replaced three Czech staff. Although the train was already riding the metals of the Slovak railway, the ZSR, Železnice Slovenske Republiki, customs formalities to enter Slovakia were to be undertaken at Kuti, the train entering the yard at around 1 p.m. Paperwork formalities would be slow, although the passports were stamped fairly quickly. The chasing cameraman got a variant on the theme. During the wait, the second class 751 prototype trundled by. Somewhat of region, the voluptuous shape and the Czech locker, the name Bardotka, at the screen goddess Brigitte Bardot. After about 90 minutes, it was time to go. Neil McNicholas starting the third class 20 before joining the crew up front to experience the run across Slovakia. The Slovak stayed true to the promised 100k operation, although the parliament's German was better than his English. Obviously, Slovak is the native language, but to varying degrees Czech, Hungarian, German and English are spoken. Neil McNicholas was soon the self-appointed translator, chipping in with the old German words. What's this place called? Uh, what's the station name? What's this called, the station? Yeah, this is Velke Levare. Oh, Velke Levare. For the two customs checks, the early shift drivers had been stirred from the couchette. Tony Boston was at the controls upon departure from Dietchen at 5 past 4. 
we passed into a few stations and then there became quite a few hand signals from the track, which I had to acknowledge with a totally new horn head, which I've never known before, being one long and two short ones on one tone of the horn. We only seem to have one tone of our horns over here. And lo and behold, there was a hand signal then, alternately displaying a yellow and a green, to which the traction inspector turned around to me and said in his, his best English, the signal is kaput. You must pass danger, it's okay to go. I can't believe I've gone the equivalent of 10 miles into my first go in such a far-flung country and I've got to pass a signal with authority, a danger. So it's a little bit of an adventure. We had three people in the cab with us, apart from the two drivers. A traction inspector conducted us through, along with a chap called Peter, who was a, a very good English speaker. He told me actually he was an English teacher, and so his English was superb. There was no language problem at all. The left-hand gauge shows the Class 20s cruising at 50 miles per hour, although the train was actually cleared for 62. However, just beyond Johor, the restriction was more like 20k. Literally a few minutes before the train for life appeared, a track gang imposed a temporary speed limit over this level crossing. From the driver's viewpoint, a K on the line side indicates the start of the P-way slack. At this stage, the line-side camera crew, who had chased all the way from the UK, had been through the mill. Apparently, the Czech and Slovak police are not used to cars with a steering wheel on the wrong side. And when the alarm explicably goes off, how do you explain that you're waiting to film a train? The answer was simple. Show them the European Rail Atlas and confess that you're English. Beyond the restriction, the locals were soon back in the stride. John Thompson was fast becoming the cultural attaché for the trip, and soon the Slovak guide was opening up. To the right is Austria, a small town over the border visible from the train. This is Marheim, in this direction. This fabric is for Zwagen, no? And this strecke rail in West Österreich. Our second OBB freight was on the Volkswagen branch, just north of the Vinska Nova Ves, where the line from a Hague also joins. So we've passed now down into Slovakia. Slovakia being about here now. We're approaching Bratislava at the moment. From what I can see out of the window, the signal is identical, or virtually identical, to the Czech Republic. Basically, it was the same as normal signal, i.e. red, yellow and green. But what we did find unusual was there are actually two speeds of flashing yellow. Or, it come to that, flashing green, which has another meaning. There's a short, quick blink, which is 60k, and a long, slow blink, which was uh, 40 kilometers an hour. So that was something completely new. What does that mean? Yellow plus flashing yellow. Open yellow yeah. is last comb. Yeah. Next signal. Next. Yes. Uh, so next. it's uh, it's junction plus next yeah. one's red right there. In a few hours we'll be approaching the Hungarian border and then we'll be passing between another domain to Hungary and then on down to Budapest. That is still going to be entirely under our own traction. I'll be taking over the controls yes. along with my partner driver Mark in a little while. The tunnel is just north of Bratislava's principal station, the train arriving in the Slovak capital on its first locomotive-operated railway. Opened in 1848, the Hungarian Central Railway was linking Ginzendorf in Austria to Bratislava via Maheik to create the first through link from Vienna. Generally, Slovak local colour schemes are more under control than those of the Czech railway. A preference for as delivered liveries dominates, since the division of Czechoslovak state railway assets. 
What a sight, huh? What a sight. The local crew found it hard to believe that they had a non-stop path through Bratislava Hlavna Stanica. After all, nobody expects to pass through capital city's principal station without stopping. Bratislava is even more remarkable though, as it has actually been the capital of two countries. For the 243 years after 1784, it was the capital of Hungary. For nine centuries, the Magyars ruled the Slovaks, just as the Austrians ruled the Czechs. And as in a sister nation, the railways here developed under the oppressor until its fall in 1918. Overtaking is a Slovak dual voltage Pershing, whilst the Laminatka is an AC-only machine, perhaps inspired by Stingray. Thanks, what? The line beside the retaining wall accesses Komarno, Dior in Hungary and Kidze in Austria. The post Berlin Wall effect saw the long lost Bratislava Kidze Pandov line reopened as a direct route to Vienna. The train for life had skirted the foothills of the lesser Carpathian Mountains, but at Zenets there was some confusion. Evidently, one of the class 20s shut itself down with high water temperature just before Bratislava Winery. The Slovak guard detrains as the DRS team attend to the hiccup of Miss Pasen Škodas. The 1533 Bratislava Tubanska Bistrica, named after the Hron River and previously seen propelling into Bratislava, had just passed another Class 263 on an increasingly late Kuti Tushturova duty. A gorilla heads west as the dilemma of which eastbound train should depart first is resolved. After over three years of abuse, the day had seen the class 20s powered up for around nine hours with five hours actually hauling the train. A little overheating was frankly expected. Reassuringly though, this departure proved that two engines were more than capable. Despite appearances, almost 80% of Slovakia is over 750 metres above sea level. Hard to believe as we speed across the Nubian plain to Šturovo, where Hungarian train arrives. In fact, by shadowing Slovakia's western, then southern perimeter, the train for life had avoided all the high ground to arrive at the Hungarian border. Nana too receives attention as the Emicus service draws to a stand. The single Romanian coach at the rear is a true vehicle from Baia Mare, attached at Debrecen where the Bratislava bound train started. The local wheel tepper moves in as the military prepare to board for customs formalities. Ahead is Hungary, a pilot man already on hand for the trip onward to Budapest. In fact, MEV, Magyar Alan Vasutuk, the Hungarian state railway, oversaw the train's operations from Djecin, rather than here as originally planned and would continue the role of liaising with local railways until Macedonia, where K4 would take over. There was plenty of time for photographs, from the paperwork on 901 to Eurostar and the RS combo. The train staff were cleared to exit Slovakia soon after arrival, a second border grip providing the ZOP entry stamp for Hungary. No stop there then. As another MEV train arrived, and appropriately a Slovak gorilla departed on a Berlin Zoo to Budapest Keleti service, it became increasingly evident that the train for life's unusual nature was a handicap. The border officials digesting the paperwork for over two hours. Sadly, daylight was gone long before the class 20s would follow this train. But at least all three were under power again as they whistled into the blackness just after 7.30 p.m. Twenty minutes on, the train passes through Budapest suburbs en route to Kurbanya Teyayat, where the wagons would be uncoupled and stable for safekeeping. The new dawn would bring a day off in Budapest for most of the crew, whilst the locals were serviced. Beyond Kurbanya Teyayat, the DRS engines would continue with the support coaches to Kurbanya Felsche station for reversal. 
The class 20s drop onto the stock before heading for Budapest Calete with a cushet backhand. After an amazing 24 hours embracing four countries, the crew could soon settle down for a rare night of motionless sleep, safe in the knowledge that by daybreak the train for life would be back on time. Waking up at Budapest Principal International Station was a surreal affair on Tuesday the 21st of September, one of those moments when the whole extraordinary train for life venture was almost too unbelievable to comprehend. But class 20s were indeed being hand cleaned by Hungarian railway men. This was no extended dream. The British train staff were somewhat refreshed too, abandoning in the Cochette's limited facilities for the adjacent Mev shower block. John Scott and the local Shanta exercise the international language of pointing as the pilot engine prepares to trip the DRS Locus to nearby bay platform ready for a press event. A typical MEF train disturbs the pigeon as the Kelly pilot gets the road. Paint were just weeks old or days for 901, the English electric veterans came up nicely for the PI event. But first, a look around the terminus. Opened as Budapest Central in 1884, it became Kelety with rail nationalisation 12 years later. A key station for pan-European passenger traffic, daily destinations usually include Belgrade, Although when delivering aid to Kosovo, Hungary's neighbour, Serbia was best avoided. The Serbs unlikely to be as impressed as the British ambassador. I think the train is a brilliant idea. I think it's a very, very British idea. I think it's marvellous that people should give up their holidays, their free time, to drive a train to Kosovo. Uh, the British companies should be prepared to contribute, that the British armed forces should collect uh, things to go on the train. Um, it's a marvellous humanitarian gesture, it's a marvellous humanitarian act, uh, and it's full of substance. It conveys all the uh, importance that we attach in Britain to what's happened in Kosovo, and it conveys it in the most direct and immediate fashion, in the most human fashion. I heard about it last week and I knew at once that this was an event I must be present at because I'm proud of what the team has done. I think it's a marvellous thing to have done, and the response here has been magnificent the interest of the press, the interest of the Hungarian railways with whom you've cooperated so well. It's been a, a great occasion and I'm very glad that we've got three magnificent 1950s British locomotives here, which look splendid. They belie their age. Like the Routemaster bus and the Land Rover, they're part of the great British inventions, I think, and um, it's wonderful to see them here. Another ardent supporter was the head of MEV on the far left, chatting to Neil Howard, was the NATO military attaché talks to John Morris. From an operational point of view, the Train for Life also gained a new member, an old friend of Andrew Pierce, Violeta Tedosa, had travelled from Romania to assist as a translator for the following day. Ready? Ready to go? We are ready? Yeah. Okay. Once the press dispersed, it was time to visit Ferencvaros depot for fuel. The cab of 2903 was uncharacteristically empty for the 5k trip, just the RS driver Mark Scheel and the MEV pilot men. How fast, Francis? 40 kilometers along the line. English has not been widely spoken in Hungary until relatively recently. Francis Orvat's <laughs> linguistic talent earning him the three-day job escorting train for life all the way from Sturovo to the Romanian border. Generally, though, because Hungarian is so unique, locals are used to being addressed in German. But if you know some Finnish or Siberian Chuvish, it could be handy. Flashing one yellow. How was? One yellow. Flashing. What's the next signal after that? The next, it means the next signal, two yellow. Right. Still 40 km. Beyond Caletti Depot and the metro over bridge, a class V46 shuns the carriage sidings just before the Budapest Jozsevaros line passes over. Of the city's four main line termini, Jozsevaros is the oddity not named after the direction. A class V43 heads for Caletti, meaning east although the light engines are generally heading south in a clockwise arc towards Ferencvaros. Class 20s are drivable from either side. Mark's power handle movements duplicated across the cab. Next one red. 
next one. Uh, there won't be next one. Yeah, because yeah. this is the station. Oh. And they are waiting. Us. Do you like music, Francis? Yes, I like. What, what groups do you like? My best group, Deep Purple, Pink like, Floyd, Rolling oh, Stones. Oh, you're a great type of guy, and you know, she's a great type of lady. Go on. She want to come for a ride, Cammy? The depot is now to the left. The coy penance virus shred kept holding the DRS locos briefly before allowing them to cross over. You can go. She not coming. She doesn't come. Yeah, yeah. Life's just so unfair. A couple of gentle moves on the power handle and the three locos are trundling across the point work. The depot buildings on the far right but as excess is from the other end, two reversals would be required. In a few moments, the class 20s would be travelling between the two freights. Mark will swap ends and in the process evict the rest of the DRS team from the rear cab. Meanwhile, the train of events crew were negotiating the Budapest city streets en route to Istvan Telek works where EMUs and some V43 electrics are overhauled. But it is also an Aladdin's cave of Hungarian railway heritage. At first glance, it appears that when MEF's team operation ceased in 1987, the staff just turned the lights off and went home. Hungary is littered with plinth steam locomotives, but few were saved by MEF's historical committee for continued heritage operation. Beside an electric of equal note is a gem of the nationalized preserved fleet. 1026 was built in 1882 for freight operation on the Budapest Pet Railway and is very much alive, as indeed are the associated workshops where steam thrives, thanks to the MEV nostalgia engineers. No job is too big, the fully restored engines enjoy frequent outings. Yet to find favor is 303002. Built in 1951 for heavy expresses, it was the second of just two examples of Hungary's final steam design. But history was also in the making across the city. Having just traversed the line on the left and reversed again, three English type ones were slowly approaching Budapest Ferenc Varos depot from the south. Line one, three mile an hour, bang on. Three mile an hour. Three mile an hour. It's from Five kilometers. Yeah, it's there or thereabouts. We're not, we'll not argue about the tent here, there, anywhere else. The huge turnout of staff to greet the strange whistling engines illuminated a new perspective. Riding the train for life, it was easy to become blasé as countries rolled by. But humanitarian issues aside, every country reached was an achievement in itself. And hard as it was to believe, this was only the second servicing stop since Carlisle Kingmore. You can go until the black and white stone on the left side. You trust us? <laughs> okay. I'm only kidding, Francis. Pull in your leg. Okay? Okay. Rest to big drop that. That's one hell of a drop. And now for some really unusual mileage. Just like the servicing facility near Berlin Lichtenberg, this depot depends on a turntable to access certain roads. Not just one, but in theory, all three of the whistling wardrobes, as the RS engineers occasionally refer to them, were required to take a spin to access the fuel point. In Berlin, of course, it was the depot pilot that performed the shunt, but here, Mark Scheel was about to experience a career first. What's more, every man and his dog was out to watch as Mark tentatively headed for his debut turntable experience. The depot is situated at the north end of the vast Ferenc Varos Hampyard. Budapest heavy freight traffic necessitates an allocation of 70 plus electrics and 30 or so diesels. The Soviet built gas guzzling class M62 Sergei's, much in evidence around the turntable. It was soon apparent that refueling was going to be slow, with each loco uncoupled, taken across the table, then refueled. With an uncertain path ahead, the DRS crew were keen to take on as much fuel as possible. Tomorrow, the Class 20s would be expected to power the train for life to the Romanian frontier, about 235k. 
However, beyond there, the Romanians and Bulgarians were to pilot the train to avoid potential language difficulties between the local conductor driver and the Englishman or Scot actually driving. It was also hoped that the Greeks and perhaps the Macedonians would provide pilot locos too. So the only other definite Class 20 haulage was for the final 100k into Kosovo itself. In theory, not that much fuel would be required, so train of events purchased accordingly. Sadly, a communication breakdown meant most of it ended up in Nano 3. Nano 1 had an all too brief drink, but it was luckier than Nano 2. Inadvertently, Nano 3 had become the favourite engine and in the name of fuel conservation, rarely would all three be in action again. The refueling trip concluded at Kelety, where one of the three Guns Hunslet intercity EMUs arrives on the north side of the station, whilst on the south side, three former Hunslet Barclay Class 20s are propelled in, complete with riding shunter. The DRS engines had already been driven into the terminus, but almost immediately one of Kelletit's class B-46 pilots dropped onto the rear for this move, tripping the foreigners to the south side of the station, back onto the train for live passenger vehicles, ready for a morning departure. Ahead lay communist heartland and the vagaries of the Greeks, not to mention the final destination, which was in theory only four days away and had to be reached on time. The PR gurus of the Train for Life crew knew all too well that no matter how magnificent your humanitarian deed, it would be overshadowed in the British press by a bit of tardy timekeeping. It was a case of déjà vu on Wednesday the 22nd of September 1999, as Budapest Kaleti, one of Europe's most cosmopolitan stations, prepared to save Vizon Tlatashra to a truly historic pan-European train. To be fair, it is difficult to avoid the capital when crossing Hungary by rail. Indeed, most international trains suffer the inconvenience of having to reverse, either here or at the Nugati terminus a situation unlikely to change until the 100-year-old argument for through Budapest International Station is resolved. The Train for Life Class 20s would embark on a tour of Budapest Rail Backwaters at 0654 on a mission to find their wagons. A 20k jog over the northern section of the Kovashut, Budapest so-called Circular Railway, ended at Kurbanya Thea Yard in the heartland of mass freight-only lines and BKV tram routes. It was reassuring to see that all was well with the wagons full of life, changing aids. School equipment, hospital drop beds, artificial limbs, wheelchairs, clothes, bedding, canned food, cooking equipment and the children's playground had all been collected by just a handful of impassioned charities. The achievements almost undermined by the tardies like characteristic of the 15 vans. The support coaches are propelled onto the front of the DB wagons. During the Train for Life servicing day, Mev chose this yard for safe storage. But as the rake was dropped off in pitch darkness, this was the first time the British crew had really seen the area. Despite being on the move for about an hour, we are actually less than 3k from Kaleti. Soon the residents of the spaghetti western style shunting cabin were required to change a set of brakes on one of the German wagons. Whilst waiting to inspect the job, Ray Towell asked Parliament Francis that familiar Train for Life question. Where is this place? This place is in Hungary, in the east middle of Europe. Yes. And now we are moving, trying to move to Kosovo. Yes. We are waiting for the brakes. And the name of this yard? The name of this place is Kurvanya Peher Thank you very much. A Class B43 heads for Jozsevaros terminus over a bridge the Class 20s had already used earlier, going the opposite direction out from Kaleti. It was certainly rush hour, another V43 passing moments later on an intercity service for the new Gatti terminus. Tony Boston awaits the right away. With superior knowledge of continental practice, one of the Eurostar drivers was always up front when the Class 20s were in use. 
The journey resumed just after 9 a.m. The train diverging right at Tarakos depot to head for Romania via Moglud, Zolnok and Bekes Chaba. Away from the suburbs, the DRS locos sing sweetly through Tapia Setru. Beyond the station, an all little used spur to military barracks provides interest as the train speeds toward the Great Plain, an overwhelmingly flat landscape that stretches all the way to Romania, an ideal time to read. Of note was the Budapest Blick coverage of the PR event the previous day. Although only Violetta, the newly acquired travelling Romanian translator, the onboard Hungarian catering staff and Mavgard could actually read it. The Great Plain covers half of Hungary, its communities relying on the fertile land enriched by a heritage of ancient forest annually flooded by water, plentiful in volcanic silt. Even basic stations like Tapios and Martin enjoy an hourly service, although the IC20 from Cluj in Romania is non-stop between Solnok and Budapest Kaleti. The region's vast forests were felt for military use during 150 years of war with the Turks. Villagers fled to relative safety in nearby towns, leaving a treeless mosquito-infested wasteland. And although late irrigation made it more habitable, just south of here is the most suicide-prone place in the world. This junction accesses Zolnok freight yards, but soon the principal route from Budapest via Seglet would converge. Zolnok, one of the Great Plains' largest communities, is something of a rail centre. The two routes from Budapest and the byway from Kikshu and Felagy Haza effectively converging as a single route east. Outside the MEV depot, the two large diesel types are M44 and 43, the latter built in Romania and supplied as part payment for its national debt to Hungary. About 80 locals are based here, most are electrics, the parrot livery on this V43 marking it as one of a hold in the midlife refurbishment program. The station ornament is a class 424, MEF's classic mixed traffic steam workforce, the equivalent today being the V43. Somewhat rarer is the MV loco away from its six car push pull rate, although they can work for occasional freights. Modern architecture is a side effect on Zolnok's war-torn past. Its bridgehead position on two major rivers made it strategically pivotal. The Mongols, then the Russians in 1944, took Zolnok en route to Budapest. The river Tissa is also supposedly the resting place of Attila the Hun, who in 453 AD died from a nosebleed after a night of passion with his new bride. But as the pallbearers were slain, the exact location of his gold, silver and lead coffin is a mystery. Another V43 passes Sayol, scene of a tragic 1994 derailment. A Nire Jihaza to Budapest train travelling at 110k hit poorly set points, its coaches colliding into this once much larger building. The east end collapsed to cause 32 deaths, a memorial mark in the spot. Beyond the station, the route to Debrecen is straight on, as we diverge right for Bekes Chaba. John Thompson savors the Class 20 sound before taking over the hot seat from this station, Mezubereng, where a brief and scheduled stop ensued. With the heat of the day increasing, 20 Nano 2 was suffering from high water temperature, so Nano 1 was cranked up to partner Nano 3 instead. Bekeschaba is the last major town before the Romanian border its regional importance underlined by the station's ostentatious architecture. Certainly, for one of the catering team, having already undertaken a return trip to Aachen, and with the Saloniki beckoning, it seemed to be an important laundry stop. Bekes Chaba was in central Hungary until Transylvania was lost to Romania, this already multicultural town becoming home for many of the displaced Magyars. In fact, the Treaty of 1920 returned two-thirds of Hungary to the Romanians, Slovaks, Poles and the Serbs, Croats and Slovenes, whose new kingdom was the infant Yugoslavia.
The stop was necessary, as the route ahead, like most of the MEV network, is single track, and the train on the left had only just vacated the section. The Muntenia, from Bucharest to Zombotli, is primarily made up of Romanian intercity stock, although a MEV electric brought it in from Kortic. As the DRS engines take away, a class M41 waits to shunt at the point where the station track work fans out as three single track electrified routes. The first, occupied by class M44 on a single wagon, is an industrial branch about 400 meters long. Beside that is the route for Jula and the Romanian border post for Salonta, whereas the train for life is heading for Lukosaza, 29 kilometers away on a railway reminiscent of the Skegness line, but with less curves. A last vestige of prosperity passes almost unnoticed. This area has a history of earthquakes, invasions, plagues and droughts. Subsequent paranoia even led to witches being burned for blowing the clouds away. Hungary is an extraordinary place. But if you want to see it at its best, visit soon. For impoverished MAV is under pressure from the European banks to abandon 1,000 kilometers of loss-making country byways or the loans to upgrade principal routes will not be forthcoming. And when the Euros arrive, this route's character is surely doomed as part of European Corridor 4. Beyond another parking stop, the Guardian of D8000 enjoys the last moments of Hungarian Class 20 operation. Drifting down in Budapest and the Romanian border. To one. Absolutely. <laughs> of the 11 countries entered en route to Kosovo Polje, only Romania required the train's British citizens to obtain visas. Issued in London five days earlier, they were provided gratis, recognition perhaps of Britain's relief efforts for Romania a decade earlier. Lokoshaza is the final Hungarian one horse town. So Kurtish, about 8k beyond the border, houses customs facilities for both countries. The adjacent yards are recorded for the DRS scrapbook, whilst waiting for passport formalities, a pilot and clearance to enter Romania. Even MEV conductor driver Francis, already heading home to Solnok, had never visited before. Effectively, arrival was at 14.38, as the border is also a time zone and arrow was lost, passing from Central to Eastern European time. Unexpected English electric activity began at 5 p.m. after news filtered from the negotiating table that the train had to be remarshaled to redistribute the weight. With the Romanian pilot edit, four locusts together would be too much for certain structures. Rumours bounded that last night significant lumps fell of a bridge ahead, hence this shunt to create two pairs of locos. The combined 146 tons of 20 Nano 3 and Nano 1 would be remarshaled into this gap between the support coaches and wagons. The adjacent electric, a Sile Ferrate Romane, CFR Class 40, would ultimately pilot the D8 train. The Train for Life lead railway was still MEV, but CFR MAFA, the newly separated freight division of Romanian National Railways, would haul the train to the Bulgarian frontier, although the route across Romania was anyone's guess. As the pilot moves off to take up its position, and the coaches are propelled onto the pair of Class 20s, Banano 2, a realization dawned that this shunt was not so simple. Although the British pioneered railways, iron mentality has led to incompatibility with foreign stock. Remember the French and Belgium saga? Well, by reforming the train, it was all starting again. Yellow and white. Couplings and train pipe connections were no problem. But the main reservoir pipes were another story. Good news, though, was that the Train for Life negotiation team had been victorious, reboarding at about half past five, just as the Class 40 dropped on. 932 examples of this 5,100 kilowatt type were built for Romanian railways. 
It's actually a Swedish ASCA design, the winner of a 1963 Rainhill trial-style showdown, with AC electric contestants from France, Czechoslovakia, East Germany and Sweden. The anticipated British entry was a no-show. The first 10 Lakers were imported from Sweden with the race built under license by Elektroputer, who infamously also supplied the first 30 members of BR's Class 56. Less said, soonest mended. Swapping engine stories. The electric deal was a bet by the Swedish government agreeing to buy Romanian oil. But had the British been more imaginative, Romania's brief Class 20 and 56 flirtation could have been eclipsed by hundreds of 85s. This smaller ASCA design was built under license by Rade Koncher of Zagreb, with 130 supplied. Three new pipework liaisons had star valves, incompatible with the local stock. John, can you ask the driver to uh, come and ask a question? That'll be controller. Identifying CFR pipes was problematic too. And the star valves only linked together, a new plain main rest pipe was created to complete the twin pipe system for the Class 20s, enabling the brakes to work with the Romanian engine. The train was ready to go, DRS having also installed a hybrid pipe made at Kingmore and last used by the Czechs, which was doing a similar job between the last coach and second 20. At 19.30, the train for life finally leaves Kurtish. Despite departure from Budapest Kaleti before 7 a.m., disappointingly, the train had only traversed about 235 kilometers all day, and progress was still slow. Although, despite the geese, this is European Corridor 4, before investment. The next few miles will be remembered as some of the most startling of the whole train for life experience. Eastern Hungary is hardly affluent, but all of a sudden it seemed that 100 years had been lost, with only the odd, almost incongruous modern intrusion. Unable to keep up with the local speed kings and with the night falling fast, an all too short glimpse of Romania's rich culture would soon be unseen, even before the first station. Being a phase or so ahead of a full moon was comforting though, for the overnight journey would be through the Transylvanian Alps, land of Vlad the Impaler and Count Dracula. <laughs> By 3 a.m., 275k of rail joints kept even the worst nightmares away, as beyond the coal mining community of Petrashan, the train continues down the Giu Valley, a breathtaking route through the Carpathian Mountains, where wild bears still roam. By daybreak, the contrast was extreme, as one of the Yugoslav-built electrics heads for Krajova as we approach Leo. Overnight, a single-track mountainous territory gave way to the Krajova to Bukharest mainline across the Danubian plain of Valachia. Considering many had retired early the previous evening, the train ambling, by breakfast, two-thirds of the train for life Romanian experience was over. An ever-changing world was slipping by, viewed from the never-changing equilibrium of the restaurant car. From the same seat, we've seen prosperous Germany, but out there, for the townsfolk of Vienna, even a cup of coffee would be a luxury. Romanians regard this as the heartland, which, when united with Moldavia, created Romania, the name perpetuating the evolution from Roman invaders and indigenous Dacians. Furthermore, Violeta's native tongue is the closest language to classical Latin, and English is perfect too. But now, as we roll into Caracal, it was time to say goodbye. Confusingly, CFR Calatori run Intercity, Express, Rapid and Accelerat services, or for those with armor plenty, the personal service stops virtually everywhere. So perhaps for Mr. Dosa, this is the ultimate personal service. <laughs> she is, she? Yes. Her sister Dana was waiting whilst Ray Towell and Porta and the Pierce stepped down to wish her la verdere. The reunion with Terra Firma was brief, as a Romanian driver had no intention of tolerating fond farewells. Soon the River Alt will be crossed as it flows to the Danube, Romania's southern boundary. 
Our destination is Romania's Sul Danubian Railway Bridge, 170k distant. The Pitesh route diverges north just before Oshior Nord, where southern branches to the Danube ports of Ternuma Gorele and Zimnica also join the Bucharest Main Line. These yards effectively cater for all five routes. The adjacent main line station serves the outskirts of Rosciori de Vede, the station name and the Breton-style shirt suggesting French influence. Any thoughts of getting off of photos were sadly thwarted, as a CFR official kept the foreigners at bay, although the Virgin men made the best of the passing time. Now that, believe it or not, is a cylinder, 12 cylinder, double bank, same as a 47. After an hour incarcerated, we pass contrasting stock and near the River Veda Bridge. Neil Howard described the delay as the gypsies' warning that the outgoing border was likely to be very busy. But what was the real problem at Cortes? The Romanian railways disappeared under a pile of bureaucracy and they just couldn't dig themselves out. They haven't encountered a train like this. They're completely bogged down with other NATO relief trains and military traffic going in and out of the country. And we came bottom of the pile. That wasn't helped by the fact that the facts announcing our arrival hadn't arrived, so we were something of a surprise to them. We were stuck for a long time because, in part, there is a communication difficulty with this whole project. We don't speak all 11 languages. In fact, we don't speak any of them. And Romanian is very expressive and very complicated, and we were very lucky to ever get our hands on a very bright and amiable young lady translator who quite simply saved the day. I was dreading this experience of going to deal with the Romanians because they have a lousy reputation for integrity. In actual fact, we found a truly delightful experience. They bent over backwards to make it work once they knew that we were supposed to be there and we hadn't turned up at the wrong country, and it didn't cost us a penny. Pre-arranged track access charges are one thing, but being a border guard in this poverty-stricken land has certain potential too. The power to delay trains for days is of considerable value. If the train for light was to cross former Eastern Bloc borders with ease, paying bribes to smooth the way had to be regarded as inevitable. It's quite common in many Eastern European countries, and we have actually been doing that as we go along. I think bribes is a very, very unfortunate word. They tend to be referred to as associated local costs, gifts and cultural exchanges. The next crossing is into Bulgaria, which could be very exciting. It's two of Europe's poorest nations, and they're both ex-communist countries. So we could meet the wall of bureaucracy again, and we should be ready to be patient for that. We're doing that at a place called Georgiou. Now, all the NATO traffic goes through there as well. As far as we can ascertain, they have received the facts. Uh, only time will tell. Although worlds away, in the DRS offices in Carlisle, staff were endeavouring to check the ongoing paperwork situation as the train continued away from the briefest of parking stops. At Aternad, the 0812 Bucharest to Alexandria service had to clear the section before the train for life could continue wrong road as far as Oten. Did they miss the number of the first class 20? A friendly lot, these Romanians, and respectful too. Oh, I'm sure he would have saluted if he'd seen Major John points on the other side of the coach. With most of the drop lights open, everyone was chilling out, although the Hungarian view on Romanian farming was also on offer. A lot of children and women were, but the men never <laughs> In communist hands, much Romanian farmland was taken over by the state. Evicted workers became cheap labour for new heavy industries which thrived in the 1970s thanks to loans from the West. However, the 1980s payback saw a huge government rationing, crucial food supplies were exported and just like its people, the railway starved. With limited fuel, services were sparse and overcrowded. Alternative election probably dates from the late 1970s Bukharest to Kayova electrification, part of a five-year plan which also eliminated steam. Derelict wagons mislead, for the Romanian railway is in a transitional period, adjusting from losing huge amounts of traffic since protected Eastern Bloc heavy industry was exposed to the real world. Perhaps 70,000 wagons are surplus, whilst the country's EU acceptance depends on pollution and humanitarian issues, but already Romanian forces serve in Kosovo in the NATO Partnership for Peace programme. On the approach to Videle, an area known for oil production, 
the train crosses over to diverge from the Bucharest main line to the Giurgiu branch. The remaining capital was in the itinerary, and in early plans the then Solar Class 37 was to be refuelled there. However, to ensure the aid would still arrive on time in Kosovo, Bucharest and its associated kudos were sacrificed in favour of this more direct route to Bulgaria, now 70 kilometres away. On the other side of this triangular formation is the spur from Bucharest, which continues as a parallel single track towards the first station, Radulesht 8K down the branch. Smack bang in the middle of nowhere, electrification ends here. An electrofuter class 62 replacing the class 40, which had hauled the train all the way from Kurtish, about 570k. Local changes here will soon be history as the branch transforms into one of the Romanian spurs of European Corridor 4, as indeed will ambling round with the locals waiting for clearance to enter the single track section ahead. Romania's Salzers are on borrowed time too. A class 60 and 62 life extension plan includes GM power units, whilst others are being sold off across Europe. But what of the train's own cosmopolitan traction? The locomotives have been stunning, as have their support team. Bear in mind that we're doing something quite unprecedented. Not just British locomotives, but British locomotives pulling a revenue train, staffed by British crew and local conductor drivers. It's amazing what you can do when the whole railway community from top to bottom is behind a project. I, I think if you came to this as a, perhaps an, an outsider to the railway community and said, oh, I've had this idea, I'm going to play trains, you would get laughed out of court. But when one railwayman speaks to another, and it's in such a fine humanitarian cause, and it's profoundly meaningful for saving life this winter, a great deal can be done. Soon, the locals expressed concern over 901 dragging its brakes, but it was just escaping air. As CFR locals push out 10 bar, by the 20s only except 7, the rest was leaking away. When this Bulgarian bound train jumped the queue, the team investigated facilities. As the Major and Ray Towell consider the science of well engineering, it's sobering that even the station's trays keep well clear, something noticed by the train's Hungarians. Beautiful. Well, Drinking water. Hot towel. <laughs> Only your face, not drink. <laughs> not drink. Yes, put up. Yes, I know, I know. After about 70 minutes killing time, class 62 number 1304 charges away for Georgia Nord as we bid farewell to the previous pilot. Familiar sound up front, the Virgin men, John Thompson and John Morris, were getting homesick. Well, 12 was it? Yeah, well, it seems to do that. The blows on it. Oh, oh. Yes. E.g. Uh, metal box. Yeah. Ah, irony. The two Johns complete the salute essential for any Class 47 departure. Meanwhile, in the saloon, there was one last chance for the DRS card school before the boss showed up. Well, in theory, anyway. The diversion away from Bucharest had one major snag. DRS Supremo, Max Jewell, had flown there to join the train for the remainder of the journey. And now he had to get to the border station before the train did. As we glide through Ternedele, Max was racing to cover the 70 kilometers to Giurgiu, where the military were rather over-attentive with this incongruous-looking passenger. He'd certainly been through the mill, although once past Bucharest, his manic taxi ride was on Romania's second best road. But it's all relative when you're used to the M6. Now, thankfully, his luggage was landing on the right train. I did, yeah. A bit exciting when I realised you weren't stopping in Bucharest. The station befits the former Genoa Sport, although the time was also where the first Orient Express passengers transferred to a Danube ferry. 
Unfortunately, though, after by now of customs formalities, the train for life would benefit from the 1954 built Friendship Bridge to access the land of Bulgarsky Državny Železnici. This Bulgarian State Railways Class 07 was to trip the 8th train across the Danube. Unlike nearby customs officials, the proud local driver had no problem with filming. At all sensitive border stations, photographers kept their heads down whilst assessing the respecter. A case of covert camera work, no shots, or possibly a lot of questions from the men with the guns. One in three Romanians were once government informers, and even though the Cold War is now history, the traditional Eastern Bloc stance on photographing railways lingers. Arrests are less common, but many staff still believe all railway photography is espionage. Beach, 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 beach. Awesome, awesome. A Hungarian, Romanian and Bulgarian conversation paved the way for a trip over the Danube. Romania would be unforgettable for the train crew. In the aftermath of one of the most oppressive communist regimes, about 30% of its population still live in poverty. But thanks to an outspoken Timisara priest who dared preach the feeling of the nation, the bloody 10-day revolution saw Nicolae Ceausescu face his own firing squad on Christmas Day 1989, a death that gave birth to democracy. Crossing the Daniel Bridge, the crew tried to recall that tune. The bridge links the rocky crags of Giorgio and Russa shortly before the Danube reaches the Black Sea, 2,850 kilometers from its source in Germany's Black Forest. Above is the E70 trunk route from Bucharest, but the river is also a major trade route, although a bit of color thanks to reckless communist pollution which killed virtually all Black Sea fish. However, things are improving, closure of Giorgio's notorious chemical plant helping friendship on this side of the river. The train slips past a symbolic communist built gateway into Bulgaria. During the worst periods of Serb aggression, this key road crossing was synonymous with vast queues of vehicles diverted away from sanctioned Serbia and the unrest in Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia Herzegovina, and then Kosovo. It's trained for life now nearing customs. Despite the late afternoon arrival, the 23rd would soon be the 24th, as the train's increasingly restless crew waited for the tiresome paperwork and the go-ahead to proceed across Bulgaria. Once again, though, unexpected Class 20 activity prevailed as the locals decided to remarshal the train. A moonlit night in the renowned cultural centre of Russia would have been rather more appealing than this clandestine photography in the nearby frontier yards. 07059 begins the shunt, having already tripped the train from Romania. 07s are the regular pilots between Rossi and Giorgio, the BDZ heavyweights well capable of hauling anything the CFR can couple to them. After the Soviet-built machine removed 20 Nano 2 and the three coaches, the remaining DRS pair was allowed to move itself. Nano 1 and 3 are reunited with the sister, the shunt shared between the keenest UK drivers. Nobody expected any hands-on experience in Bulgaria. The 07 slips away to Giorgio, making way for the train for life's third Skoda Electric. 43048 drops on ready to go, nearly nine hours after the train departed from the other side of the Danube. The 615k trip from northeast to southwest Bulgaria had begun at last, but identification of countless stations would be hampered as half the signs and Cyrillic lettering. Time for a nap. Just after 8 a.m., the train for life rolls into Mezdra, a rake of ammonia wagons blocking the view of the station, giving rise to conspiracy theory perhaps born of restless sleep. Humanitarian aid or not, Russe border officials chose to aid the brake coach to the rear of the train, complete with armed guards. Or perhaps it was the mysterious overnight shunt. Somehow, 421149, a different Skoda, was now piloting the train for life, although it too was to be replaced here by Class 45. Thankfully, the Class 55 and wagon soon vanished, and despite pre-breakfast reluctance to risk ambitious trackside shots, time flew. A class 32 arrives from Levishta. 
Mezdra on the Gorna Orahovica to Sofia Main Line is also the junction for Vidin, which will soon benefit from a new Danube road and rail bridge from Kalafat in Romania. This will double railings between the countries and ease Giorgio Rossi congestion. Beyond Mezdra, the train for live daylight Bulgarian run passes the first of many Shkodas. The route from Rusia to Mezdra had been largely single track, typically in this part of Europe. In fact, only about a quarter of Bulgarian system is double, but 67% is electrified. Limestone hills dominate the Mezdra to Sofia line, which once within the Nubian bridge is complete, will be the core European Corridor 4 route to Greece and Turkey. Massive EU investment is creating a streamlined trans-European rail network, known as European Corridors. Beyond Germany, Corridor 4 inspired the basic train for life route, although the massive investment of doubling this section, including countless new tunnels and route diversions, dates from the mid-1970s, when over 800k of the BDZ was doubled amidst rampant electrification. The railway company is amongst Europe's oldest. State-owned from its outset in 1888, services began a decade after Russians liberated the Bulgars from five centuries of Turk oppression, the birth of an historic bond. Despite fighting World War II with the Germans, the Bulgars defied Hitler's orders to attack Russia, choosing neutrality instead. Soviet troops entered Bulgaria unopposed, and the Republic was born. This is Zverina. Under communism, many places of worship became museums for the national good, whilst the government promoted atheism. Standard Eastern Bloc policies included mass industrialization and creation of efficient state-run farms, but private plots could be tilled in spare time. And partly thanks to incentives for workers, Bulgaria prospered by Eastern Bloc standards. We are now approaching Levishte, where the EMU seen at Mezra started its journey. One word encapsulates the next few miles. Gorgeous. Below, the Iska sculpts its way from its source, three head streams high in the Rila mountain just south of Sofia, through this, the Balkan mountain range, and onwards to the Danube. This really is the big country. It's up to 800 feet from the valley floor to the top of the world. But unbelievably, this is not regarded as the most scenic Bulgarian railway. Well, frankly, though, you're spoiled for choice in this luscious land. The switchback route offers the occasional glimpse of the 23rd vehicle, the BDZ coach, and soon the first train in ages is passed. Evidently, engineering work was creating congestion, although with the ballast job seemingly over and the Electroputer built class 06 trundling east, things were returning to normal. Beyond Lakatnik, a haven for mountain walkers, the rhythm of rail joints and endless tunnels is interrupted by more P-way activity as the train nears Bov. Moving slowly across this bridge enabled its impromptu inspection, which raised the old eyebrow. Like most Eastern Bloc railways, the BDZ is impoverished. Everyday maintenance harder to fund than special projects. Class 44, the standard Bulgar passenger loco, holds the late running 0740 Sofia to Pleven service. A case of you are lucky, we dream of only being an hour late. But now a new theory had evolved. The hour loss changing brakes in Budapest, meant a less urgent K48 train, was mistaken for the train for life. It then effectively hijacked the dedicated express pathway beyond Kurtish, our train condemned to ambling. But at least everyone got to see the pilot engine during the parting stop and the multi-storey community just 40k from the capital, Sofia. The BDZ driver compares size. Oh, 700 kilowatts. Dina, Dina, Dina. The cultural attaché strikes again. No language is too difficult. Not that impressed then. He's got 3,040 kilowatts from one loco. England. Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. And this lot are from Carlisle, which is definitely not in Scotland. Another class 44 cruises through on train 460. 
The 2204 Thessaloniki to Budapest Kelete is a temporary service created in August to avoid Serbia's devastated railways. Behind the two lead BDZ coaches for Russe is a single Greek one and MEF pair which start the main formation for Budapest. The next three are probably on charter, one Slovak, the next Czech and the Polish one. The excitable Poles are well known for Aegean camping coach holidays. The final vehicles, Romanian and Bulgarian, serve Bukarest. Bof found itself on the Serbia avoiding route from 1st of April, seven days after NATO airstrikes began, when through traffic across Yugoslavia officially ceased. By the 12th, bombing physically severed all three routes, until the 26th of September, just two days away. The reopening of Gardelice Bridge south of Niš would once again allow north-south rail moves across Serbia. However, with Slobodan Milosevic still in power, any attempt to deliver aid across Serbia would be foolhardy. All Kosovo-bound aid had to arrive via Albania or Macedonia. The only way the train for life could reach Kosovo was via the massive detour through four additional countries. Pivotal to the route was Rusay's Friendship Bridge, which brought the team to Sofia. The normal Pistan route would have been due south from Budapest. After the previous pilot, 451609, scuttled away, 441428 8 dutifully arrives at Elianci in the northern suburbs of the Bulgar capital. Beneath the Škoda plate, another denotes allocation to Podwena in Cyrillic lettering. We're supposed to have a grown up to tell them something about the pipes, aren't they? Yeah. Otherwise, the end of the world happens or yeah. the wheels fall off. Or... Well, this time last week, the train's epic voyage from Derbyshire was suffering a communication breakdown. Sold when the lost Kodna Park Junction ground train key arrived by taxi from Toten. But here, local railway liaison is even more tricky as Russian is the second language. And to a Bulgar, a nod means no and a shake means yes. However, John Thompson was doing a sterling job supervising coupling. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Not in shakes considered, it's probably just as well that the British crew were not asked if they wanted to take the direct route to Belgrade. With a DRS manufactured link now standard fixture, John couldn't resist a look inside the BDZ 25 kV Skoda. Yeah. Right. Right. People, train. Yes, People, freight train, passenger yeah. train. On UK loco, switch. Good freight, passenger. And uh, goes up. With the train formation complete and that it's longest ever, Major Points gets a quick shot. Well, once the stray dog gets out of the way. Possibly a hundred thousand of them roam the city, Pegs becoming alarmingly territorial at night, the existence a side effect of recent social changes. After just over an hour, the train restarts for the Greek frontier at 12.32. Ahead is the main line into Sofia, but as the driver breaks to diverge west, the speed dives as the train heads for uncharted territory, the cameraman soon realising he should have brought lunch too. We are now skirting the northern perimeter of Sofia. The city has 1.1 million residents, but with a passion to eradicate all things Ottoman, it has little to redeem itself architecturally. At Voloyak, another class 44, 091, awaits its next GT. Ahead is a multiple junction, three electrified routes diverge, left to Bankia, ahead for Pernik or Blagojevgrad, and right for Yugoslavia. That line was electrified to Dragoman in August 1997, but beyond Anish and Belgrade. The train for life took the middle route, which heads south to eventually join the Sofia to Blagojevgrad mainline, although this route is a little down at hill. Post-1989, traffic losses have resulted in tightening purse strings. The BDZ had thrived under communism, with 950k plus of new routes and pro-freight modernization. From 1949, the Council for Mutual Economic Assistance, Comicon, 
coordinated the Eastern Bloc trade, the Soviet Union securing markets for manufactured goods while supplying raw materials at low prices. But Mikhail Gorbachev perceived that the Soviet economy was being trained by his Eastern Bloc comrades and the escalating cost of Cold War armament. Addressing these problems could bring improved domestic living standards at home and widespread reform. At Hrabarsko, the friendly crew of the O925 Kusedil to Sofia looked that they've been waiting for some time. In fact, the Radomir Kustendil Dushevo branch may be extended into Macedonia as part of an Adriatic to Black Ceiling, the other end being the train ferry from Varna to Novorossiysk in Russia. Plummeting downhill, the train would ultimately diverge from the passenger route beyond Razmena. The line to the left serves Spernik, while the chosen route is a cut-off to join the main line just north of Kopanica, technically shorter, but translating the speed, 13 miles per hour is none too racy. And this other spur to Pernik has seen better days too. The Sofia avoiding line may be a rare mileage, but rejoining mainline metals was most welcome. Nearly two hours had elapsed since leaving Ilianzi, which is at best 40 kilometers away. Two parting stops ahead at Radomir and Dornirakovets frustrated more, although the crew found another Dupnica easy on the eye. To the left, a Škoda had just arrived with a 1550 Sofia Kolata, as an EMU terminates on a 1700 from Bobov Dol. The other train is a 1655 Blagojevgrad to Sofia. Incidentally, these units were supplied from 1970 by VZ in Riga, Latvia. As for the train for life, it lost its sixth Škoda pilot for another of electroputer machines built under license from Brown, Bovary and Salza. The driver of the 06 was proud of his machine, although the future of the class is doubtful. BDZ plans to ex 70% of its diesels in line with much reduced requirements. The guard looks less welcoming. Time to film the Colata service departing behind 07038 in a brush new Cirelli Clevery. The mainline trains swap motor power as there are no wires to the south. The best known examples of this type are probably German S Class 232s. Sadly, with long single track sections ahead, the train for life would have to wait. A few US dollars coming in handy when waiting for the road. <laughs> By departure time, the sky resembled Dupnica's nicotine stained river. The tobacco industry is massive here. Six Bulgarian locos hold the train for life. The archaic but charming practice of crews having dedicated engines is alive and well, albeit time wasting. But at least this one was justified. The Bob of Dol branch diverges. Diesel haulage between Dupnitz and Kolata on a Greek frontier was already threatened. By mid-2001, the entire 131k route was expected to be electrified, although in the late 50s, the World War I-built Struma Valley Line was still narrow gauge. To the east are the Rilla Mountains, home for Soviet missiles during the Cold War. The sun sets over the Uzgovska range in Macedonia as the onboard Hungarians continue to prepare the last supper as we enter Blagojevgrad, named after the founder of Bulgarian Marxism. <laughs> Bulgaria's bright post-communist resurgence has been slow despite early elation. The day after the Berlin Wall fell, an internal Communist Party coup ousted the corrupt Bulgar leader. But since then, poor democratic choices brought more corruption, chronic unemployment and 300% inflation. As for the Train for Life team, the immediate future was indifferent too. All catering would be lost on arrival at Thessaloniki. However, in theory, there was no problem, as optimists believed that by noon the train would be in Kosovo. Another day had turned to night, but for some it would be a very long one. Leaving Bulgaria, no problem, but entering Greece wasn't so easy.
07.30, Saturday the 25th of September 1999. A bedraggled and bewildered Train for Life team watch as a Greek big MLW having just arrived from the Bulgar Greek frontier and only traversed about 15 kilometers, remarshals the train at Strimon in order to head west. This complicated shunt would reverse the formation, was once again split in the class 20s to redistribute the weight. Strimon in the Krakinia Basin is named after the nearby river, actually a continuation of the Struma, its flow to Aegean Dam just west of here to form Lake Krakinia. A457 speeds east on the mainland towards Alexandropoli. One of 20 delivered from 1973, its consecutively numbered sister soon arrived to continue the shunt. This would ultimately be the pilot for a 125k trip to Thessaloniki. Post-1960 dieselization of the Hellenic Railways Organization saw 69 North American built Alco-powered locos arrived in Greece, 12 were narrow gauge. Alco, an acronym for the American Locomotive Company of New York State, supplied four classes to OSC, Organismos Siderodromon Elados. But from January 1969, the Montreal Locomotive Works took over production. The A451 or MX627 class were the first Greek Alcos from Canada. The 2902 was once again tucked inside the pilot, whilst the other Lakers would travel betwixt the coaches and wagons, the only vehicles not shunted during the 80-minute stay. This is home for the border pilot, the Greek Loco always working into Bulgaria. The little-used cross-border link, two passenger trains each way daily, originated as a World War I 600mm gauge line, the track bed being reborn from 1965. A pair of MAN and Hellenic shipyards built class 701s depart towards Drama as the Shanta prepares to couple up an OSC brake van. The latest train for life edition would bring up the rear to complete the new formation. But as the crew discovered last night, Drama isn't just a town hereabouts. Upon arrival at Kulata, the crew tried to guess the delay. One cynic predicted five hours, but even he proved to be an optimist. 8 hours 37 minutes elapsed before the journey to here began. If you were asked to put money on who would cause delays, you'd say it would be the Bulgarians. They're an emerging communist nation and uh, with very little money, they're one of the poorest countries in Europe. Much to our surprise, the nightmare turned out to be the Greeks, who uh, may well be an ancient and honourable people, but their railways are absolute rubbish. We fell into a, a very, very deep black hole. We could get hold of absolutely nobody to speak to. There were no locomotives, there were no drivers. Uh, then there were plenty of them, but none of them could work for us, and no one could tell us what was going to happen. And as a result, we spent a whole night on the Greek border in the middle of nowhere, and we're going to be 24 hours late, or later than planned, into Kosovo. As far as I'm concerned, the sooner we get out of this wretched country, the better. At Veronia, two of the more adventurous British drivers were looking around the MLW cab, comparing notes on the trip from Strimon. Because there's no DSD, is there? A sober review. Three devotees call themselves alcoholics. Greek barriers are habitually premature. Nano 2 bucks about as a Canadian-built pilot confronts foothills, formed by the convergence of two mountain ranges. To the north, Mount Kerkini forms frontiers with Bulgaria, then the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. The railway shadows the borders at a distance of about 10k, as far as Doirani. Incidentally, despite the Alco invasion, Greek steam never officially ended, it just confined to specials. OSC retained considerable but largely inactive steam assets. Strimon is barely above sea level, but west of Rhodopoli the line ascends to nearly 300 metres near Mures. The whole 200 kilometre journey across Greece was followed thanks to the Quail Met Company, at last a decent railway map.
the line turns due south beyond the influence of Mount Vissora. Ten minutes beyond Rodopoli, ex-Yugoslav lands are now just over the Mispok Mountains, but A458 is boiling up. The class generally enjoys excellent reliability, but the way things were going, soon there would be no water to cool down the 2,700 horses. The DRS vultures wait. men often rescue Virgin West Coast trains, but this was potentially a Thunderbird duty to save her. After nearly 20 k of hard climb, the lure of Greek diesels is obvious. Sadly though, from 1998, new arrivals from Ed Trans wiped out most early Alcos, leaving 28 MLWs to soldier on. Abandoned rails continue into Dorani as the train takes a cut-off open in 1980 to increase the line speed and shorten the route. The replaced station was near the shore of Lake Dorani. A text message arrived from the world of Virgin Deltix as the other end of the lost route is espied. Its adjacent lake half Greek Macedonian and half former Yugoslav Macedonian. In classic times, both areas were within the Macedonian Kingdom, which by the 20th century was part of that then weak Ottoman Empire. The railways here were built by the Turks, who held these lands for centuries, this land opening in 1896 as the Salonika and Constantinople Junction Railway. At Kalindia, the map is consulted. Historians regard this as the completing railing between what are now Istanbul and Skopje, an archery from the heart of the Ottoman Empire, which was lost to the Bulgars in the First Balkan War in 1912. They lost it a year later to the Greeks. As we curve left, another line once headed straight on for Polikastra, 27 k distant on a Thessaloniki to Skopje line. Built by the Allies during World War I, it's sadly long gone, so this British aid train would have to reverse for Skopje and Thessaloniki. After near Philadelphia, the Gallicos is crossed. This bridge will be avoided from 2002 with the opening of another cutoff. Greek railway investment is riding high, the main line from Turkey amongst priorities. British cemeteries litter this area, a byproduct of World War I Salonika campaign trench warfare. The Bulgarian forces were back on behalf of the Axis powers holding back the Allied advance into occupied South Serbia. For the trouble, the Bulgars earned 600mm gauge hardware from Germany and thus railways such as the Strima Valley were born. Train of events prepare for reversal and round two with the Greeks on approach to Thessaloniki, where the line from Srimon parallels the electrified route from Idomeni, the principal rail border between Greece and the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. Despite of these scenes, the second city of Greece is an ancient history haven. Not that the train for life theme was to see any, for soon they would be heading north on this parallel line. Now one of the best railways in Greece, it was electrified as a precursor to the main line from here to Athens, an indication of the once heavy freight traffic from this busy Aegean port to what was Yugoslavia, which is now not too far away. It's nearly but not quite the end of the road for us. It is, sadly, the end of the road the Hungarian team who have been looking after us. I'm sure we will all agree that we have been an interesting and challenging group for them. We do only our work. After much thanks, an official photo was presented. We are here if you want to bring back to England these locomotives. We have Again. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Coming back with the empties. <laughs> On arrival, the pilot quickly scuttled away to reveal this remarkable lineup, not least one of the stylish Italian built single car units. Soon, a rather more functional machine appeared to begin the shunt, reverse the complete formation, reunite the class 20s, and remove the MAF coaches. 
potentially quite involved. I'm glad we've got that sorted then. A119, one of 30 diesel hydraulic shunters supplied by Krupp from 1962, begins stage one of a shunting saga. The Mediterranean sun harlots the page beneath the top's number, suggesting lost heritage. Nano 2 was once named Lorna, after one of the staff at Hanslet Barclay. For the record, Nancy and Alison also made the trip and would soon be reunited with their sister, one of the stages of a crypt infector style challenge. Time out, lads. Talk about making a mountain out of a problem. This belief was rife. This was a job for international rescue. John Morris looks on as the brake van is loose chanted onto the rear of the cochette. Never mind that there's supposed to be 15 aid wagons in between, not to mention the position of the class 20s. Eventually, UK power propelled the cochette and brake van south, an unexpected bonus for the Scot, who had an anticipated writing grease in his book of driving turns, or indeed passing the aid wagons being propelled onto the brake van he's just dropped off. By this stage, an unbelievable six locos had been involved in the shunt, although reversal was almost complete and as a bonus, the next pilot, the 3,600 horsepower Big Daddy of all Greek Alcos, performed an impromptu run past. The train for life could have looked like this had it journeyed without the DRS donation and travelling team. All 14 railways traversed were effectively sponsors, most only charged crew and fuel costs. With 16 wagons again in tow, the single coach and English electric trio were added to the formation after 130 minutes of shunting, although the cachette was none too welcoming as the train took on a new aura more in keeping with the humanitarian aid mission. All luxury had gone. For the remainder of the trip, the only running water was cold and from a stagnant tank. Sanitation was traditional and the catering, well, baked beans and brown sauce was a highlight. It's not too bad, actually. Mika takes a spicy sausage. It's Meanwhile, down the corridor. Here we are having a fine meal of um, Hungarian um, salami sausage. Thank you, Raymond. Um, Raymond likes to call it a salami sausage, I would prefer to uh, call it something else. What's the general opinion of the baked beans and uh, brown sauce and bacon? Excellent. I think we'll have to get them imported, Mr Pierce. You can be the sole proprietor. <laughs> sole importer. <laughs> the Hercules flight back over five hours could well be interesting. Ooh. This Ooh. week, I had been a mostly thing to baked beans and brown sugar and <laughs> During the Aspros parking stop, delirium set in. Perhaps it was the heat. A501 restarts for Domeni. From 1989, electrification of this 76k route from Thessaloniki to Domeni embraced track renewal and realignment, but relations to the north curdled between conception and completion eight years later. Consequently, OSC's first electrics, six Eurosprinter Star Locos, order for Thessaloniki's copy services, were yet to work beyond Domeni. Castro is where the line from Kalindia once joined, 
Had it remained open, the train for life route would have been about 125k shorter. Soon the Axios River is bridged. Better known by the Yugoslav name the Vardar, its valley will be traced all the way to Skopje. The railway, another built by the Turks, linked today's Thessaloniki and Skopje in 1873 and Mitrovica the following year. Operation was by Turkey's Oriental Railway until 1920, despite Turk eviction seven years earlier, something that began 55 years of near perpetual Greek conflicts. These defences date from World War II, when unsuccessful invasion by Italians through Albania preceded German occupation. Later troubles resulted from a rise of Greek communism and America's determination that Greece should remain democratic. Beyond Axiopoli, there was some alarm. Red. <laughs> Passing red lights is common. Greeks often rely on cab radio for signalling. Mount Skole is across the Axios, whilst to the west, the Mount Pycock foothills include molybdenum mines. The gorge concludes at the frontier, where Greek Macedonia meets the ex-Yugoslav version. Trouble began in 1992, when the new country declared itself to be Macedonia, despite the name of the adjacent Greek territory. Greeks regard Macedonia as the land of Alexander the Great, a Greek-speaking king, accusing the Slavs of trying to assert the cultural legacy, something reinforced by them hijacking this ancient sun motif used here by the Greeks as a centerpiece for the new country's flag. At Idomeni, the baby Alco border pilot stands silent as the train for life's third MLW returns south. Greece proposed Vardar Macedonia, or Skopje Macedonia as alternative names for its neighbour, easy mediation resulting in the present clumsy title from 1993. However, the Greeks were still unhappy, this route suffering when they initiated a trade blockade which lasted for two years until the new country agreed to change its flag. With activity again in slow-mo, the crew descended on the station cafe, its unexpected rush hour ending when the Greeks decided to employ the border pilot as the next train for life loco. Dating from 1961, this was one of the earliest Greek alcos, its size proved to be its key asset. In fact, this border pilot job provided some of the last regular standard gauge passenger alcohol haulage in Greece, as a section across no man's land, although wired, was not energised until 2000. Politics, perhaps? Here we are on the border between Greece and Macedonia, which is slightly bizarre because Macedonia doesn't even exist, and though we've had our passports looked at, they haven't been stamped because the customs people who aren't here don't recognise Macedonia. In the background, John Thompson is showing the finer points of the Class 20 to the driver who's taking the Alco locomotive forward. Um, hopefully, within an hour, we'll be up in Skopje. But could a 1,050 horsepower Alco haul this train alone? He wouldn't need to. The reason we've had to start this up is because he can't make the main reservoir here. And this local has got to be small, just, we might as well give him a little hand. Off we go. And he's a great day, he wants a little hand. The historic Alco and English electric double header Max for Jevgelia. Next stop, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. The train for life's latest journey across no man's land, a whole 2.6 kilometers is almost complete, the border town of Georgelia preceded by an almost dry river. 
entering country number 11, Mark Shields swaps seats with his Virgin Trains compatriot. Another new country for John, just in case Macedonian Railways provided a pilot engine. One of MZ's four EMUs built in Latvia awaits departure with a local service to Skopje, one of only two a day, although international trains between Thessaloniki and Skopje double the service through here. The EMU confirms that even here the war is alive, so this Greek diesel pilot duty could cease with improving neighbourly relations. Soon the Train for Life crew received their final passport stamp, then waited for customs clearance and synchronised their watches. The train had just returned to Central European time. It departed Idomeni at 17.08, but reached Gergelia at 16.14. The station exterior is less impressive, although there is a nice children's playground opposite. This Class 61 was one of 50 supplied as post-World War I reparations to Serbia by the defeated Axis powers. Once known as South Serbia, two-thirds of this nation's 2.1 million population are Macedonian Slavs, who bear no relation to the Greek-speaking Macedonians of ancient times. Today's language is closest to Bulgarian. The cameraman only sorry he didn't know how to say thank you for the unprompted party trick and run past. Back at the station, customs officials were less friendly, insisting on inspecting the contents of two wagons. Meanwhile, the DRS prepared the engines for a trip to Skopje, the Macedonian capital. No pilot was forthcoming, just a pilotman and a usual weight problem. I want the front engine on the back. Say again. I want the front engine front on the back. back. Unless 903 is on the front of the train, we've had it. Sorry, I'll go and, I'll go and Inside Nano 2, they had a tanky stopped up. A barrel was installed in weed killing days in case the loco was away from a suitable water supply. Get a receipt! Coca Cola light! Please! The RS prepared to top up their own fluid levels before attending to 903. That's gone on really easy. This hasn't gone on well at all. Well, bloody hell. Hang on, let's have a struggle. Fuel is siphoned from the auxiliary to the main tanks. Unlike the 20 stroke 3s, extra tanks on 20 stroke 9s are not an active fuel source. 20 minutes later, the trio performed the Makedonsky Železnice shuffle. Plus 20s are very versatile, with three engines and multiple. Any combination can be driven from any cab, even if the driver's loco is actually switched off. However, the enforced double header had to include lead Leica 903, as it was the only engine fully fueled in Budapest. Caution was better, as the formation which departed for Skopje was likely to continue to Kosovo Polje, about 300 k. Nano 2 trundled south to comply with weight restrictions and potentially act as a banker, but a new pipework drama also awaited the DRS team. Continentals had often tried to use just one pipe instead of the British twin pup system, but the Macedonians wanted to run Nano 2 as a swinger, coupled but with no true breaking from the lead duo at all. Suffice to say, the RS were horrified, so the whole train was through piped on departure in 1914. This route provides an electrified backbone for the MZ system. Sadly, the nocturnal trip only offering the crew glimpses of the Varda's evocative upper reaches. Railway magazine correspondent Charles Woodland recharges his mobile, possible only when the train was on a move. Did he anticipate trouble? Deep limestone gorges and sparse settlements gave way to the largest community on the route. Veles is also the junction for Bitola and the other rail border crossing with Greece. Bob Sweet phones home as one of MZ Swedish designed electrics is passed. Excitement ahead included a local jumping on hobo style, 
followed by his eviction before the train terminated in Skopje after 10 o'clock. This view greeted the Train for Life team on Sunday morning. And with early risers Neil Howard and John Morris off negotiating with the local authorities, there was plenty of time for housework. Or perhaps a line. Dreaming of last night's stirring run from Jeff Jellia? There was a lot of action verbally last night. We came up under our own power through the mountains, which was absolutely beautiful. Uh, again in darkness, which is a bit unfortunate, but it was a full moon and it looked really impressive. Uh, when we actually got to the Martian yard here at Skopje, uh, there was a train crew waiting to take us forward to Vukovar, which in our mind didn't actually sound very safe or, or very encouraging. But the overnight sanctuary became a prison as the pre-arranged agreement with Macedonian railways melted away as the temperature soared. What's more, with no welcome in the control tower, just two bottles of drinking water and no sanitation on the train, the OK to go came as a great relief just after 11 a.m. As you can hear in the background, it looks like we're in business again. It's been a very difficult 18 hours or so because we've come across the Macedonian border and they've basically attempted to hold us to ransom for a very, very large amount of Deutsche Marks across in their country. Uh, we've now been through some quite detailed negotiations. As you can hear, we're on the move again, so let's see what happens. In the bunker, John Thompson was still buzzing from the drive up front the previous evening. So we had two Macedonian drivers on the third plate. We couldn't speak a word of English, not, not a word, um, but Neil McNicholas was here as well. We could speak a bit of German and they were, they were communicating broken German to him. But before we left, we, we, we understood from each other. They understood I was a driver, I understood they were drivers. We explained the controls and how to stop the, the train in emergency and uh, we communicated with hand signals and, and pointing to the speedo and we had a, a superb run up to Macedonia. It was as smooth a trip as I've ever had. However, the delays were taking that toll and the aid delivery still seemed all too far away. I think it's quite sad actually. I think we've come all the way across Europe with the greatest of cooperation. Although at the border point, it's a very unusual train that's never been done before, so people are interested, people were supposed to want to double check everything before they let us go, but I think it's sad that we've came within 18 miles of the Kosovo border and we've been here for 15 hours without any real sign of moving yet. 20 minutes after start-up, all was quiet. The ransom remained at 17,000 Deutschmarks, about 5,000 pounds, or the equivalent in gold. Meanwhile, the six British wagons were detached as collateral, but as each wagon was valued at 80,000 pounds plus, it was time to bring in the heavyweights. The British Embassy, NATO, the Home Secretary and friends across Britain. This has happened before with other convoys going in through Skopje and through the Macedonian border. However, they are demanding money with menaces, for I understand that some of the train staff was actually threatened by some of the Macedonians. Of course, you've got to remember that some of the Macedonians are also Serbian as well. All this aid, of course, is going to the Kosovan Albanians, and we're dealing with very poor countries, populations who are Serb, Albanian, and the war, of course, has created tremendous differences between two groups of people. Which is sad because we would help all people who are suffering what has been happening in the refugee crisis within Kosovo itself. But yes, this issue is of course very infuriating and I'm worried about the staff because if they have never been in this situation before it can be quite intimidating. It would be a night of troubled sleep. Monday, the 27th of September 1999, the British media, both newspapers and television, covered the latest twist in the Train for Life story, although the broadsheets seemed more interested in Sloboda Milosevic mountain problems. As for the train crew, discovery of a McDonald's proved they were in a civilised country after all. A long taxi ride meant the goodies were barely warm, but they were much appreciated. This is me. Max Jewell managed to find another option. As for the train, the British wagons were now recoupled, with the exception of the one containing the Macedonian playground. Sunday negotiation had proved difficult. One suggestion was that k railway unit from Polje should collect the train, but Perseverance was winning through. No, I think it's all been done. Rupert was on the phone last night and he got hold of uh, the British ambassador uh, and he got a fax to um, Pristina, the headquarters in Pristina, which seemed to unblock things slightly, so it, it's really started to move. Well, here we are in the yard into uh, our third day, I think it is, and uh, we've just signed all the paperwork. We spent a, a long time talking with the authorities and with the customs. 
and it looks like we're finally ready to go. Let's get aboard. Well done, my good man. <laughs> and this man here. The Aussie hitchhiker from downtown Skopje was placed too. Have got a conductor? Yeah, someone. Yeah. yeah. A local one? Yeah. Apparently, yeah. Or just one of ours with a bit of hair dye on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of course I know the road to book about. Oh, it's a Sunday, I'll go. Yeah, no problem. It's a Monday, isn't it? I'm not quite sure what day it is. <laughs> Once again, John Thompson was in the banker. Version HQ just won't leave John alone. Sadly, the next call wasn't so amusing. Time to call off with the newly purchased water. A paperwork hiccup led to further pacing, but locals slipping away from the yard prompted speculation. Tony Boston accentuates the positive. The one theory I've got is that he may be going on up to the border station in order to bring the uh, pilot drivers back down. So obviously there's no regular train service, so maybe they think that's their, their little bit of transport back once they've done their job. Are these weeds getting taller? 18 minutes later, the piece would once again be shattered. So that's what Macedonian pilot men look like. Their appearance a good sign. You'd better eat your lunch quick, Mark. It's time to drop to Kosovo. The paperwork problems were apparently resolved, but after three false starts in two days, nobody was counting their chickens. Hello. Yeah, we're ready to go, Mark. Take it away. Fourth time lucky. 37 hours after arrival, the train for life restarted its epic voyage. Departure from Skopje Yard at 11.52 brought a huge sigh of relief, but was the reception here indicative of the region? Many Macedonians feel their country was blighted by the huge influx of Kosovo Albanian refugees, and the West should have assisted more. A view held by the control tower staff, perhaps? For the few Brits who dared enter, this quality was an experience best forgotten. In fact, Macedonia was best forgotten, although it was impossible to look forward to entering Kosovo. The Jevgelia route diverges south. Although the train for life didn't use this spur, it arrived from Jevgelia at the other end of the yard after a mystery tour of Skopje. John Thompson sends another message as the train navigates an anti-clockwise course around Skopje. High-level intervention ensured the Macedonian extortion was sidestepped, but King's ransom would have to be paid to mobile phone companies. The principal negotiation phone ran up a bill for nearly £300 in just 36 hours. Macedonian Electrics, then this rare Soviet-built class 667, one of a pay supply to Yugoslav Railways in 1981, passed almost unnoticed as the crew mentally prepared themselves for Kosovo. If the seven days travel from Aachen created any rose-tinted illusions about the ultimate European rail adventure, then Sunday shattered them. Macedonia, just like Kosovo, has ethnic issues, further destabilized by the arrival of over 335,000 Kosovo refugees. Pessimists had feared the doomsday scenario, ethnic war spreading into Macedonia and Albania. Right, are we being held for those, right? <laughs> I think they've got the road, Neil. They've got the road, matey. <laughs> this man had no trouble with the train, as long as it didn't disturb his herd. Over the top is the Jovjelia Skopje Belgrade mainline, reopened throughout the previous day upon completion of post airstrike bridge work at Gredelice. Hello! <laughs> the friendly shepherd was escorting goats along a mainline spur. About 400,000 ethnic Albanians live in Macedonia, the NATO backing of Kosovo Albanians giving Albanian nationalism a fantastic boost, something for Macedonians to be wary of. 
The sad reality is that free of Serb oppression, inevitable reprisals blurred the line between Kosovo's good and bad. But being from multicultural Britain, the team's only hope was that the age should benefit the most deserving. Mika says the lead locos. The last train MiG banked was loaded call to exit the central from St. David's. The route to the right is for downtown Skopje. The capital's key geographic position ensured that it became a vital transport and administration centre during the Kosovo crisis. But here too there is much poverty. Greek sanctions delayed international recognition, whilst Yugoslav unrest curtails more trade. Brace yourself to be stoned. Thankfully, though, not everyone here is hostile. We curved north for Volkovo Station in Kosovo, where Serb rule began in 1913, just as it did here. However, from 1945, Belgrade transformed South Serbia into the Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia. A manufactured Macedonian identity included an official language and religion to undermine Bulgarian claim to this region. Macedonia's peaceful independence from Yugoslavia was aided by the belief that its people are Macedonian rather than Serb. Kosovo was not so lucky. NATO had to pick up the pieces after Belgrade flexed its muscles to protect Serb interests. Volkovo was reached at 12.45. All normal railway operation was now behind. The Yugoslav Railways, the JZ, ceased regular traffic to here in February, but just three days ago NATO reopened the war torn railway for through freight to Kosovo Polje. Two K4 railway components made the train. The Italian Railway Engineer Regiment were taking over from the British Army's 79th Railway Squadron. The Kennedy class escort loco takes up position at the rear. K4 requisitioned 23 engines abandoned in Kosovo by the retreating Serbs, who sabotaged most of them. The mainline fleet of just three operational engines was about to be doubled by the ARS. At the station, an aid worker called the British ambassador with the news. He said this is what happens at weekends, of course, you know, and then the world falls to pieces. He said, you can hear the train now as I'm speaking, so he said, that's good. <laughs> but now, a Monday paperwork delay. Are you in which are you in? I'm not, I'm the centre manager of the train, I'm like this. Yeah. Right. You've had a few uns. <laughs> this rail frontier for the UN Protectorate of Kosovo rarely requires Macedonian passport clearance. We're now at Volkovo, which is the final outpost of bureaucracy as far as Macedonia is concerned. The military railway authorities now take over formal charge of the train and we've got an armed guard to take us forward up into Kosovo. Uh, behind us are the mountains, and eight kilometres that way is the border and what you might call bandit country. The train restarts for Kosovo on its first reopened railway. NATO bombing terminated all Kosovo rail activity on the 8th of April. The last JZ operations on this route were the infamous deportation trains of late March, born with Yugoslav forces escalated ethnic Albanian persecution in response to the NATO airstrikes. Bombing was envisaged as a credible threat behind negotiations, but when Milosevic called NATO's bluff, the West found itself at war. Tragically, the two and a half months of conflict saw Serbian barbarism, extrajudicial killings and the destruction of entire villages reach new deaths. Now, the barely concealed war wounds of the NATO-liberated province needed dressing. The train for life's raison d'etre. For the remaining 80k or so, little was said. Everyone had seen news reports of villages burned, mass graves and vast refugee camps. But the war ended nearly three and a half months ago. Kosovo was already old news. How big would it be? The Macedonian cement factory would prove to be the end of normality. The Shar Mountains and Albania are to the west as the train storms up the Lepenets Valley, which the railway shares with the main road from Skopje. Behind are the Black Mountains. This natural route through the mountains has a long history of conflict, 
and more recently refugee camps and congestion. K4 vehicles are not delayed at the upcoming Blacha border point, but north of Skopje commercial vehicles had to endure three staging points, often losing a week before entering Kosovo. John Morris looks for the now abandoned refugee camp just before the border, where traffic is not too bad today. But this was the expressway to enter Kosovo. A veritable two-tone symphony celebrated crossing the border at 1417. The cement factory is almost silent as a frontier town is entered. It's known as General Jankovic to Serbs or Han Yelezid by Albanians. Kosovan Albanians used the railway site from here as a mine pit footpath to the refugee camps just inside Macedonia. News footage that gave birth to the train for life idea. The exodus was breathtaking. On one day, 45,000 Kosovars entered Macedonia. Most fled in fear while spec deportation trains evoked memories of Nazi Germany. Refugees disgorged here, served forces herding them at gunpoint out of Kosovo with only the possessions they could carry. But now they were back, thanks to NATO. The Kachanek Gorge is a dramatic introduction to Kosovo, driver John Thompson relishing every moment. This deep cleft in the limestone terrain was bridged by Yugoslav communists upgrading the ancient mountain road. Previously, the first modern transport to conquer this valley was thanks to the determined Turkish railway engineers pushing on from what is now Skopje to Mitrovica. The steep forested slopes are wildlife haven, protecting wolves from all but history's most determined hunters, such as Marshal Tito. The Acropolis from Athens to München was the route's premier service into the 90s, but class 20s were staking a claim for its most historic train. Files on a humanitarian aid distribution were temporarily abandoned in favour of 2901's cab, as the charity representative enjoyed the purse of her job. The road tunnel and long bridges hindered the possible use of NATO ground forces poised in Macedonia, although ground invasion was always doubtful even when bombing failed to arrest the worsening humanitarian crisis. Poised for potential peacekeeping, the forces built refugee camps and with the light at the end of the tunnel, became the Liberating Army in June 1999. Kachanek's silent cement works was formerly served by a 20k mineral branch. Fed by aerial railways from Ostrovica, it ran along the Lepinets Valley to the left, behind the town. K4 attempts to restart industry were hampered by a decade of systematic replacement of Albanians in authority. Now the pre-war managers were gone. Fear of Albanian revenge saw Serb residents flee in another twist of Kosovo's ethnicity. In one of history's most remarkable refugee reversals, half a million Kosovo Albanians returned home in the first three weeks. The train for life embraced as another symbol of NATO liberation. Warhead Pass was not a war in the true sense. NATO was on a moral crusade, not out for territorial gain. Kosovo was still in Yugoslavia, albeit under UN management. As the first torched houses come into view, one couldn't help wonder, did Albanians or Serbs once live there?
The Class 20s continue through Kachanik Station with Mark Scheel and the guardians of Sergeant Jones. Misleadingly, the station exudes normality, for passenger operations are years away. The priority was the winterization plan. CAFO aimed to make at least one room habitable in every Kosovo house before winter set in, and logistically, the DRS Lakers were pivotal to the scheme. This community of about 10,000 Kosovars was industrialized under Tito. Its name, derived from Kachanlar, means fugitives. Bandits fresh from a raid on Uskop, now Skopje, hid in the gorge until caught and massacred by Ottoman troops. Kachanik was also where the constitution for an independent Kosovo was promulgated in 1994 and was at the heart of the recent guerrilla action. Bitter fighting in the hills led to Serb reprisals and several mass Albanian graves in this valley, as well as the Kosovo Liberation Army Cemetery. The children shouted NATO and Kosovo cheering as though the train for life itself was a conquering national hero coming home. An early hiccup for K4 rail operation happened here. The train ploughed down six wayward cows in the Runjevo tunnel. Once bombing ceased, the restoration of this rail link from Skopje was essential for bringing in humanitarian and peacekeeping supplies. Within a few weeks, the Italian railway engineer regiment, renowned for rebuilding Bosnia's railways, intended to restore 60k running throughout, achieved by importing its own construction train. When originally opened, this railway helped relocate Kosovo's commercial centre from Prizren to Pristina, despite its extension into Western Europe being sidelined by the 1878 Austrian occupation of Bosnia. Nevertheless, the new front line saw this route begin its military career, originally serving Mitrovica's Ottoman garrison, but now a peacemaking empire. This is where the Americans are building a new empire. This is where they are intending to bring all their trains into it. Right. Galitz, isn't it, Galitz? Yeah, yeah Galitz. Are they going to bring engines across with them as well? No, they're just going to They'll be using us. This wayside station was commandeered as the railhead for Camp Bonsteel, the headquarters for the US Army in Kosovo, which is a little way to the north, six kilometers east of Roshovac. Villagers wave enthusiastically, but few houses here remain intact. Many refugees returned home to find burnt-out shells or at best at homes looted by Serb forces making civilians pay for NATO intervention. The K-4 operation saw the province split into five multinational brigade areas of responsibility. The southwest sector is under the US Task Force Falcon, its nearby HQ being the largest single project undertaken by the US military since Vietnam. Just like the facilities here, Bonsteel was nearing completion at the time. It would house around 4,500 personnel. Beyond the Piwe Slek, the train continues across the central Kosovo plain, where small settlements are dotted between the maize fields. But these odd houses were not destroyed at random. Was this pre-war, wartime or post-war destruction? The capable presence protecting the neighboring Serb Orthodox Church from looting is perhaps all the answer needed. The 50,000 capable troops thought they were here to save Albanians, but they're merely arbiters in a province of huge ethnic intolerance. The children of Arizai find cheer amidst devastation. Before the war, over 110,000 people lived in this town, known in Serbian as Uroševac. Few Serbs there live here now. Brave ones, however innocent, have to be protected from the wrath of the neighbours. And with scenes like this, vengeance was inevitable. Each ruin represents somebody's world destroyed. Did they flee in time? Were family members in the KLA? Every shell a tragic tale. But physical destruction is one thing, the loss to families, to livelihood is incomprehensible. Is there any speed 
over this crescent. Stay, Kay's right for the, the uh, station. Soldiers exclaim ancient jalopies, whilst new building work is probably funded by relatives working in Western Europe. Not many tractors today, are they? I think they've uh, been coming. Many vehicles had no number plates. They were removed by Serb authorities as the refugees left the country. With no papers and no proof of Yugoslav identity, Milosevic planned to refuse re-entry. Well, you see how close they get? I mean, yeah. sometimes you can't really close. With, with the bigger engine as well, the back. This lively town, Kosovo's third largest, is a principal intermediate community on the Skopje to Kosovo Polya route. The strategic importance of this line ensured priority reopening, as well as it becoming the last to return to civilian operation. K4 was systematically reactivating Kosovo's 330 km rail network, but with all lines damaged, these were formative days of a very long job. The pre war railway workforce was 2,500 about half Serb and half Albanian. However, from November, 700 men would be re-employed, although many, these gangers included, were already helping out. Not so long ago, the station ahead enjoyed five return stoppers from Kosovo Polje, four continuing on to Skopje. A railway town from 1874, Parizai, as it was then, soon grew when Albanian settlers fled Serb genocide around Niche. But cruelly, Serbs became the masters here from 1913. Thus, Parizai became Parisovic, then Orosovac. See, there's carriage on the left-hand side. This is one of the ones that were involved in the accident. Oh, yeah, you yeah. see the head turning, huh? You see on the other side. This vehicle tipped over along with K4-branded Kennedy class number 254, which proved beyond repair. The derailment occurred just beyond Oroševac K4 base. Like most international authorities, K4 used Serb place names for political reasons. NATO's insistence that Kosovo should remain in Yugoslavia for at least three years was a sticking point with Kosovo Albanians during the last ditch peace negotiations. Ultimately, though, if they hadn't signed, NATO would have walked away, leaving Milosevic to do his worst. On the face of it, Yugoslavia was oppressing a guerrilla movement rising from the civilian population, an internal matter, until innocent civilians suffered indiscriminate Serb vengeance. Beyond the site of the accident, the train returns to line speed, the crew enjoying celebrity status. In the distant hills is Račak, home for the KLA cell which killed four police in January ambushes. Serbian revenge saw a death toll of 45, 36 were unarmed civilians. The Train for Life organizers didn't know it then, but the event would change their lives too. The massacre focused the collective mind of the West, the march to war unstoppable. Bob Swede distributes sweets passing the fields of Gračko, where 14 Serbs were killed whilst harvesting, six weeks after K4 arrived. The KLA was amongst those who condemned the attack. Lipjan retains one of the last sizable Serb enclaves in the region. After months of planning and 10 days travel, the physically drained crew rode an emotional roller coaster across Kosovo, from relief through shock through complete satisfaction that the train for life was a glorious success. I think I would like to say on behalf of every one of us how pleased we are that Neil and John have persevered with this scheme throughout. Both of you deserve every bit of thanks that we could possibly give. And would you like, please, to join with me in giving three cheers to both of them for a job well done. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! hip. At 1600 on Monday, the 27th of September 1999, the local crew celebrate as the British locomotives arrive at the K4 Military Railway Operation headquarters to complete the greatest ever rail journey from Britain. The Italian guards of Teretna Yard Kosovo Polje watch as the mainline local fleet is doubled. With new resources, the rebuilding of rail served devastated towns could step up a notch. 
the blankets and clothes would further help soften the blow of the first post-war winter. And with medical and school equipment, so much more could now be achieved. In typical British style, the moment was nicely understated. The train for life was not just a great journey, it was so much more, but for the class 20s this was just the start. Italian soldiers would soon be driving them as the British Army's 79th Squadron and the Train for Life crew headed home. For both parties, it had been a long tour of duty. On the platform, a media frenzy ensued. The Carlisle men catching up with friends in the army, whilst others had a tale to tell. Staff Sergeant Wilson satisfies the press request, the opening of one of the wagons loaded by British soldiers in Mochen Gladbach. Colonel Hess in the middle was the face behind the US Department of Defense insurance deal to cover the class 20s in Kosovo. Thus the arrest offered much more than power for the train for life. Max and Mark sum up Carlisle thoughts. Absolutely excited and enthralled and we feel it's absolutely super after a long journey, frustrating at times at some of the border crossings, but exhilarated to be here. In Macedonia I was getting a bit worried, uh, spending what, in excess of 36 hours there, uh, but there's no doubt I knew the train would get to you, it was just when. We're absolutely pleased to be here and we're really pleased that the locomotives are going to make a contribution to the humanitarian aid in the area. We're leaving them here for 12 weeks, um, as a minimum, that's what we've agreed with um, K4 and um, Colonel Jackson. So we're hoping from then we'll have to come back and pick them up at some time. The locomotives have brought out will be invaluable. The aid that brought is a wonderful gesture to Costa. Thank you very much. Lieutenant Colonel Jostling receives the official memento as colleagues take snaps. Positivity reigned. K4 was now better equipped than ever to save thousands from a Balkan winter. So here it is, finally. It's taken its time getting here, but it should provide an invaluable lifeline for Kosovo in the long, hard winter ahead. John Line, BBC News, at the train for life in Kosovo. The British press couldn't resist the predicted late train reporting. Chiver spirits saw the job through to the bitter end, despite 55 hours lost to officialdom and extortion since Budapest. For a time, the train for life might have been abandoned as copy for K4 to collect, but for this team, now on top of the world, 95% of the job was not an option. The train for life raced outside the K4 rail HQ. For the crew, the cochette was still home, but K4 would return the star back to Britain ASAP. The Italian regiment was sleeping in the other cochettes at the time. Beyond the checkpoint, the nearby village looks normal, but few areas were definitely clear of mines. Looking north, Teretna diesel depot beyond the bridge was inoperative and off-limits. Kosovo Poly is ahead and Pristina to the right. Hereabouts in 1389, Serb-led Christian forces met Ottoman invaders, but despite their retreat, subsequent Serb propaganda has interwoven the Battle of Kosovo into the national identity. Therein lies the problem. The following morning, Britford troops addressed the fallout from the latest Battle of Kosovo near the site of the legendary 14th century battle. The first job was assessing the aid destination of each wagon load, ready for redistribution, starting with the aid collected by the British Army families in Germany. Destinations included UNICEF warehouses, a children's hospital and schools in Kosovo, as well as a Skopje orphanage adopted by British troops. A British army loco enters the yard from the south as the Irish arrive to begin loading. Over 50 nations form the K4 umbrella, the Irish being based in Lithuan. Behind, the Train for Life crew get a welcome cup of tea. The Italians were poor host, so this was breakfast. Lieutenant Colonel Joslin clarifies return arrangements to Bryce Norton as grim-looking tea is ladled out of a bread bin by John Thompson. Then the train, joint British and Irish loading of school equipment continues as an Irishman watches a British Army Steelman Royale. Four of the Thomas Hill locos were imported from Kyneton and Bicester. Edge Hill and classmates were prolific on the P-Way trains which reopened the Volkova route. Kosovo saw two notable British firsts. Army locals were employed overseas for the first time since the Normandy landings in 1944 and Britain and Germany fought together. 
In fact, the traditional enemies were leading lights of the Kosovo initiative. Milosevic hoped that with no NATO country attacked, the 19 member states wouldn't hold together, but any doubt evaporated when the ethnic clearances escalated. His stubborn refusal to back down led to the endless bombing, which destroyed Serbia's economy. Every aid delivery needs an escort and every escort a mascot, but which to choose was dilemma for defender driver Besh of the Royal Signals. Ahead lay a journey to Klina school, about 50 kilometers west. In peacetime, Klina was rail served by the Kosovo Polje to Pech branch, but as that was still closed, the aid traveled by road. Beyond Kosovo Polje's checkpoint congestion, speeding along the main road towards Pech and northern Albania is misleading, for Kosovo's road network has big problems. With the bridge on the main road missing, this diversion was necessary. A dozen road bridges were hit by NATO airstrikes, so K4 created makeshift bypasses, but congestion is a regular issue. The Albanian ones are too bad to Within weeks, the dust would be winter mud, a real problem. Hold it here, back. After 20 minutes of roading, the Irish lorry returned to Tarm Academy, where the load was checked before resuming the trip to Klina. Here, the state of the road is not derivative of the war, but of Serbian economic apartheid. As if to illustrate, the tractor driver was a crater. In the back, Steve Bennett of the Adjutant General Corps made sure the escort and load were separated. 90 minutes after departing Kosovo Polje, Klina School was reached. During the recent conflict, it was used at Serb headquarters. Western Kosovo bordering Albania was a heartland of the conflict between the KLA and Yugoslav forces. When a NATO action finally forced Milosevic to back down, the school here was threshed, as Serb forces returned home unrepentant. Since then, a determined community effort emptied classrooms of ruined furniture, ready to start again. No doubt K2K would have been reassured by students marking in, as everything from furniture to stationery was unloaded. Traditionally, both Serbian and Albanian are recognized languages, but Serbs claim that a rapidly growing Albanian population in the 80s was forcing Serb students to learn Albanian, which was resented. What's more, Kosovo's growing unemployment was blamed on a rise in ethnically pure Albanians, unemployable in the linguistically Serbo-Croat work environment elsewhere in Yugoslavia. Certainly, the end of government funding for Albanian language schools created massive unrest. But within days, this school will open again to begin a new era. Train for life unloading continued into the night. This convoy was destined for schools in Klina and Pech. It had been an eventful day. Other train for life workers found themselves in a Pristina riot in which two civilians were killed. The railwaymen were okay but shaken, the flights home lost to injured British soldiers. The new day saw the important driver training begin as Max was given a realistic appraisal of his locus future. The British wagons would be unloaded in Mitrovica, perhaps the most fractious community post-war, where a river divides the Albanian and Serb populations. This K2K load is for Pristina Children's Hospital. Driver training was complicated by the need for the Italian captain to translate Mark Shield's words. It's just as well he could understand Geordie. When the plane changed from class 37s to 20s, there was brief military concern. But they actually proved more suitable. The Albanian driver is very interested in the new steeds. The real benefit of the 20s are their rugged simplicity. And soon they were branded Jeeps on rails. As a team gathered for a cup of tea, 2901 began its new career. Meanwhile, aid delivery proceeded apace, although traffic gridlock on the main road into Pristina meant a long detour to the children's hospital via Obilic, about 9k west of the capital. Just off this road, the lignite mine was yet to be reactivated. Electricity generation briefly depended on oil, with power only available for a few hours each day. Institutions such as Pristina Children's Hospital relied on generators. This aid delivery would be delayed by the need to advise with another. Zerazuli, the name of the orphanage is Detsky Dom, I spell. Delta Echo, Sierra Tango, Kilo, India. New word, Delta Oscar Mike.
That is Macedonian for children's home. Over. Captain Peter Rao of the Power Trip Support Battalion is greeted by hospital staff as his team from the Royal Logistics Corps begin unloading. Out to me, the hospital's largest aid delivery so far was its principal, Dr. Mirja Shala, and to his right, assistant professor Mirveta Kalamendi. K2K spent about £5,000 on medical equipment, including a micropillary heart pump, apparatus for blood tests and tuberculosis detection, as well as wheelchairs and mobility aids. This is clothing for the children. But what did the hospital still require? Everything. For example, food, milk for babies, clothes, maybe books, notebooks, everything. We are very grateful for help from Great Britain and we hope that we will continue our collaboration. Thank you very much again from me, from our colleagues and from children. The work of Mirveta and her colleagues is hampered by sparse facilities and what little equipment there is needs replacement thanks to more than a decade of financial starvation by Belgrade. The fresh victims of war are innocent children straying into mined areas, but the wounds of orphans run much deeper. A handful, such as your son, are residents. But how long will aid continue to feed her? I was in Australia and I noticed that now Kosovo is not very popular on TV, so now it's East Timor and Turkey and everything. But hopefully yeah. he will become things better and better. The orphans are part of the hospital family, clearly loved by the staff. Captain Rowell and photographer Bob Sweet were treated like ambassadors invited over for coffee. Do you think that the hospital, um, the equipment and the provisions that you have is now improving? We need. need for example, I am a pediatric cardiologist and uh, I know to make a diagnosis with echo, but we have no machine because uh, this machine costs very much yes. and we can, can't afford it. Mm. We have no food for children. Within a week, Serbs locked Albanian staff out of this hospital. K4 arbiters in an ongoing, unresolvable feud. But the late afternoon, the final K2K lorry load is passed at Kosovo Polje by a pair of XJZ Class 661s. Number 132 in peacemaker livery leads 231 in regged Zajnica Yugoslovenska Železnica colours. K4 resurrected four of the General Motors engines. The only other salvageable Oka was a class 641. As for the DRS Lakers, by the end of the day all three had seen activity. Nano 1 and 3 headed for Skopje with an inspection train, whilst Nano 2 collected this French Leclerc tank during driver training. Generally, heavy trains would be hauled by GMs, but the British Lakers would make the pitch and prison branches their own. Soon, about 40 trains a week would run from here. Three months of intense activity would see 200,000 tons of winterization materials delivered. The resumption of passenger services was the other mission for the Italian regiment. From December, this station would be the starting point for a multi-ethnic mixed train to Zvechen, just beyond Mitrovica, the first tentative steps to normality. Locals sabotaged the previous renegade serve service. The escort leads the last K2K delivery. The Derby 8 wouldn't head north until the 15th of October, but the train for life crew would fly home in the morning. Their achievement was great, but the physical trip paled into insignificance when faced with everyday Kosovo. Perhaps 10,000 Kosovo Albanians were slain in those few months of terror. The worry now is, will the fragile peace only last as long as the peacekeepers stay? The West perceives that blood revenge grips both sides, but civilized society does not tolerate barbarism. Kosovo independence will remain a dream unless ethnic intolerance is sustained. I never felt hitness in my life. I, I don't understand. What is hitness? How? How to hate? What is this? Yeah. I don't believe. We, we are all humans, mm. aren't we? We're all human mm. beings and um, it's, it's difficult to see how these things... Somebody has right to live, to, yeah. 
to create their their life. I don't, I don't understand. On the 8th of April 2000, 2901, its humanitarian career over, heads north near Newbury before skirting Oxford, en route from Kosovo to home in Carlisle. The three DRS Lakers return by ship from Thessaloniki to march with military port near Southampton. The Class 20s saw three months intensive use in Kosovo. They usually worked solo, initially on aid deliveries, but later hauled construction materials to rebuild Kosovo homes. Direct rail services MD McJewell was proud of his company's contribution, but tragically, he would never know how much good his locals achieved. On October the 11th, even before the Derby 8 was unloaded, one of Britain's most dynamic railwaymen tragically lost his life in a freak cycling accident in Cornwall. Just days earlier, he remarked how, after Kosovo, I found myself reassessing what's important in life. The naming of the very first DRS locomotive perpetuates his memory. 2301 leads through Helsby in September 2000. Max Jewell was in a unique position to offer something that really did ease human suffering. The enthusiasm with which he grabbed the opportunity was almost his signature. The train of events theme through immeasurable toil found like-minded professional railwaymen to make the inspired train for life idea a reality. The British are generous, assistance was forthcoming for the less fortunate souls of each new fragment of Yugoslavia as the Milosevic vision of greater Serbia ripped it apart. Removing Kosovo's autonomy in 1989 began a chain of events that saw the Federal Republic shrink to about 40% of its original size and become perhaps Europe's poorest nation. It is often said that the Yugoslav crisis began in Kosovo and it will end in Kosovo. Only time will tell. It would be ironic if Train for Life 2 was destined for Serbia. Perhaps the last word should go to the man in the hot seat on arrival at Kosovo Polje. It was a privilege and a pleasure uh, to actually get the train over 2,000 miles from Britain to uh, Kosovo to help the unfortunate people here. I think it's, uh, it's great. Proud to be part of the, the train. <laughs>